So with that, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off. It looks like uh, we have the majority of the signups online. So uh, today we'd like to start off with uh, a message from Surface Tech President, Mr. Steve Santa Cruz. Uh, Steve, if you don't mind, take it away. Thank you, Joe. Steve Santa Cruz here, President of Surface Tech. Uh, we're welcome to Surface Tech's sponsorship of an exciting three part series on asphalt technologies. This session, is a second of three, and it will be co-presented and co-moderated by Phil Blankenship of Blankenship Asphalt Tech and Training out of Richmond, Kentucky, and Joe Dennis, our VP of, uh, he's our Vice President and CTO on the asphalt side. Both men are extremely well-versed in the topics that you're going to be presented on today, and very fortunate to have this combination with regard to Kind of getting you a taste of uh, learning something new about something very old. Uh, we we started the series out last time in that vein, and it will be carried through again today. Uh, we have a big international audience today, and very much appreciate the attendance. We're confident you'll appreciate the presentation and content. Uh, and on that point, uh, as it's probably gotten kind of uh, a little hackneyed with respect to the situation at hand, but nonetheless. Uh, the COVID-19 situation keeps us very disciplined and diligent and vigilant with regard to all things in terms of containment awareness, um, our PPE disciplines, both at a personal level and a professional level, and remind you that as we are now getting into season with regard to our plant readiness, um, much of that has to carry over with regard to those disciplines uh, on site. So just be mindful as we are trying to attack the curve, as you all know, and uh, get a handle on this so that we can start to uh, re-emerge back into the business aspects of what we all endeavor on a day-to-day -day basis, but do so in a very mindful manner, not rushed, mindful. So today we're going to be talking, uh, as Joe Dennis has said, about the balanced mix design and then get into good, better, best test Really what it is is a bottom-up, top-down, crack mitigation, awareness and understanding, and how our product line actually does a good job of mitigating that cracking issue. We feel that we have a very strong uh, system to do that, and uh, one that really has a value proposition that is very complete, one that is um, a cost uh, a savings, uh, uh, highlight a uh, performance characteristic boost, a, a ease of adoption, and a sustainability feature. And that ease of adoption is also a very important aspect because, as you all know, needs to get into the asphalt uh, and, and uh, perform very well easily and without a real impact to critical path. And I think you're going to find that to be the case today. So, Without really any further ado, I want to turn it back over to Joe Dennis, who will get the party started. Again, thank you very much for your participation and look forward to talking to you again on our third series. Joe? Thanks, Steve. Appreciate the comments. And again, welcome, everybody. Um, this is our second part, as uh, we've mentioned, uh, of our third part, our three part uh, series on uh, really trying to improve one of the biggest assets in the world, and, and that's our asphalt pavement. So um, before we uh, get started, I thought I would review with everybody what we're trying to accomplish today. We have a number of items, as you can see on the screen, that we're going to walk through, and that's going to be started by uh, Mr. Phil Blankenship uh, on balanced mixed design. For those that attended the, the first session, that was uh, the, really the last uh, 15 minutes or so that Phil presented on. And uh, we thought we would start this one off with the same uh, uh, slide bank and uh, allow him to reiterate the importance of balanced mix design because it dovetails into everything else that we at Surface Tech are doing as we move uh, into the industry and try to help solve uh, the, you know, both these cracking and rutting problems. So that's where the genesis of good, better, best, and test has come from. So we'll review that. We'll review our products. Uh, we'll uh, review how we 
couple of our products uh, with regards to the performance in lab and how we uh, uh, best uh, marry those to the, the solutions that are needed out there. So we'll talk about uh, where we want to use those technologies and uh, we're going to share a little bit from our R&D platform today. I think will be very exciting for everybody. We'll kind of uh, end up today uh, going through some projects and field performance of several projects we've been tracking since 2015. I think you'll find that interesting. We'll uh, round it out with a, a life cycle cost analysis of the technologies. And then if there's time for any of those uh, lingering questions, we'll get into that. Mm -hmm. So let's start off if we could with a, the first uh, poll question of the day. And uh, this is just to help everybody locate uh, and, and, uh, and, and operate the poll questions. And I'm going to go ahead and launch this now. Easier said than done sometimes. Here we go. OK. Launch. Hang on a second. Well, I guess everybody's seeing it. There it is. Okay. Um, hold on, Phil. You're not up yet. There we go. So where in the world are you connecting from today? Yeah. United States, Canada, Europe, Middle East, other. Like I said, we have people from all over the world. We're really happy to have everybody here, and thanks so much. Um, we have uh, about... 56% of you have voted. Uh, go ahead, everybody. Uh, let's uh, let's get everybody participating, and then we'll get this thing rolling. So, all right. All right. Let's uh, share this information. Phil, can you see that? Uh, yes, I do, Joe. Okay. For whatever reason, team, I apologize. I cannot see it on my computer. That's pretty weird. So anyway, 44% of us are from the United States, 53% of us from Canada, and then we have 3% uh, from around the world. And keep in mind, we, we have people joining as we speak. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Phil Blankenship. There we go. Uh, we call Phil affectionately the Batman. He is the owner of Blankenship Asphalt Tech and Training. Uh, Phil is a great friend, a mentor, a wonderful asphalt consultant, uh, and has been a part of the Surface Tech family now for a, a couple years in a consulting role. So we're really happy to have Phil here. He helps guide us with all things asphalt uh, related, including mixed design uh, and development. And so with that, Phil, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you kick off the latest trends in mixed design, balanced mixed design. Thank you, Joe. Um, appreciate that. And um, I'm going to go ahead and, and let's hide that poll, Joe, and get, up, get those slides going. <clears throat> so first off, I wanted to say thank you to Surface Tech for uh, allowing me to speak a couple of weeks ago and then, of course, this week. And it's a topic I really in, enjoy to look at. You know, when I, when I think about when I first started in the industry, um, started uh, actually at Asphalt Institute when I was uh, working on the InDesign experiment there, you know, things were just asphalt, uh, binder, and rocks. Uh, polymer modified asphalts had, uh, had really started to, to come on in the, in the late 80s, early 90s. But be, basically, we're dealing with, with asphalt and aggregates. And <clears throat> today, you you look at what we have going forward. We we saw the introduction of of recycled or reclaimed materials. We have seen all the different additives now. We're seeing bio additives, and one of the one of the products that we we just hadn't thought a lot about was was fibers. We've seen a lot in concrete, but but how does that actually look in in asphalt? Well, what what you're going to end up seeing and through this through the end today is is, is a lot of focus on the, the aramid fiber product and, and i think it's one you'll enjoy because it really opens your mind up <clears throat> in how you 
began to modify your mixture. We, we typically think about just modifying the liquid asphalt, but um, I really want to challenge everybody to think once we, as we move away or alongside volumetrics and, and more towards balanced mix design, you have so many options out there to be able to improve your mixture. And, and one of those tools, again, is the aramid fiber. Um, aramid fiber has, has been around since the 90s that you're going to find out. But one thing that you're going to one thing that you're going to see with the fiber that we have uh, today is not only is it well proven uh, from the 90s and, and before um, fiber fiber has been used again in, in different ways, whether it's polyesters or things like that. But the aramid brings a whole different dimension and aramid. Think of it as a dry polymer. So as I as I go into this and I said to hand it off to Joe, that's where we're going with it today. And then. Uh, so again, I'm covering the balanced mix design piece, and then Joe is going to go in to talking about uh, the the how and the why <clears throat> and the testing program that Surface Tech has set up. Again, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Joe, and all the folks out there at Surface Tech. And I want to thank everyone for joining. And uh, with that, uh, let's uh, um, I'm going to uh, move on to my uh, next slide. Joe, it's I am struggling to control this thing here, and uh, well, you can't. I am. Okay, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> but it's Sorry. not doing its thing either, so something's weird going on here. So, folks, I'm going to go ahead <clears throat> and begin to just talk about the generic definitions as Joe's working out the details there. And um, as you all know, a, a good presenter knows his slide bank and <laughs> and can present without the slides, but the slides are there for the visual aids. For you so uh, let's I'll go ahead and, and begin to, to walk through this and then we'll bring the graphics up as they as we get those worked out uh, so how does balanced mix design begin to fit in, in what we do today um, if you think about what, what industry has defined for a balanced mix design a, a, an asphalt mix design a balanced mix design use uses performance test or what I call performance related maybe one-off tests such as an index test on appropriately conditioned um, specimens, and that's important that they're appropriately conditioned to address multiple modes of distresses such as rutting and cracking, and we use those very generically. Taking into consideration uh, mixture, aging, traffic, and the climate uh, where it's going to go down. So let me give you an example. Uh, a lot of these tests that we've seen, uh, they've been refined by the state of Texas. Well, if I take those tests and I go and implement them, in Minnesota, I better adjust my test parameters uh, for that climate because what works in Texas will not work well in Minnesota. And so I do need to to begin to make those uh, make those adjustments accordingly. Uh, any luck there, Joe? If not, I'm just going to move on. I have no idea what it's doing, Phil. Oh, no, <clears throat> no problem. And if you have to restart that, that's that's fine. <clears throat> so so a lot of the, um, the the need that we have today for balanced mix design. Is is based upon um, the need that you see on your highways, whether it's rutting or cracking, but overall, and I would even say internationally. Uh, we, we tend to have a, uh, we can have a cracking problem. Uh, we, we've, and, and part of that's because of the crude, this, that the crude slates that have changed, but, but it's also, um, it, it's the use of recycled materials. Uh, it's because that recycled materials, we assume 100% of the asphalt in a lot of areas. Uh, we assume that 100% comes off of that, and it really doesn't. Uh, we may only get 80% off the wrap, uh, maybe less. And off a of RAS, you're going to get less than that. So on paper, your design may look great, but in reality, you may be low on asphalt content. Um, so the need for balanced mix design is really going to drive, drive us to be able to, to make those improvements and also the need to understand the performance-related testing. Oh, thank you, Joe. Looks like something's popping up, and I don't know what's happening. Yeah, I think I got it fixed. Sorry, everybody. I, yeah. We have had some issues with the GoTo webinar format, and what they're telling us is so many people are working from home, 
uh, all of these uh, uh, platforms are just being overstressed. So I think I've got it fixed. Okay. Let's move forward. <clears throat> Great. So, so on the slide that Joe has there again, what we're doing with balanced mix design is I would love to just tell everybody that we're doing performance testing only, but balanced mix design to me, and this is Phil's piece on this, is that I'm going to take my initial volumetric analysis and then I'm going to overlay that with my performance testing because the initial volumetric analysis helps me eliminate some of the stuff that I know is not going to work without having to add on my, my next layer of testing. Okay, Joe. So just in the U.S. alone, and uh, folks up there in Canada, I'd love to pull you in on this one, and I hope that your roads are doing better than ours, but I'm betting you're probably in the same boat that we are. Um, ASCE, the American Society of Civil Engineers, gave us a rating of D on our infrastructure. <clears throat> uh, we've had a, we have not really increased our funding uh, since, the, since the 90s. And as you see here, uh, 6.9 billion hours delayed in traffic with 42 drivers per hour. It's, it's, it's unbelievable um, what, what has happened as we've diverted our funds to other things, national security and so on. With that, uh, why is this happening? Well, it's not just because of the way we're designing, but if you begin to look at, at, our, at our daily traffic, our daily traffic has gone up. And as you see after 9-11, about 2001, it begins to decline but it still has, since 1970, gone up over 200% and then declined a bit. What I want you to pay close attention to is the daily load. And, and this is coming uh, from FH Highway, FHWA Federal Highway Statistics on, on truck weights. And when you begin to look at that, you re realize that your average daily load is pushing over 700% increase since 1970. So we can blame it on asphalt, we can blame it on rocks, we can blame it on recycled material, or you can just understand too that we have a lot more load on the on the pavements today and we're seeing different distresses than what we would have seen years ago. So again, balanced mix design, as I said earlier, is this is is the balance between durability and 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 also stability, cracking and rutting in a generic form um, that we want to, uh, to address there. Let's uh, let's go ahead, Joe. <clears throat> so, in taking a distress uh, survey that was reported by asphalt contractors, and this was a, a, a survey done by uh, Randy West and, and others, you see there that reflective cracking um, was was a prevalent um, number that came back that that states are seeing, followed by thermal cracking, fatigue cracking, longitudinal cracking. If you notice, what's what's common there is cracking, cracking, cracking. And rutting in the U.S. Is, is way down below that. Well, what do these cracks look like? Uh, let's take a look at a few of these pavement distresses, Joe. <clears throat> if I'm if I'm looking at um, if I'm looking at what I think of whether it's bottom up, reflective, thermal fatigue, or, or thermal with low temperature, everybody has a little different uh, different take on these. The one on the left, you may see more on a country road. The, the reflective, you may see over concrete. The thermal uh, block cracking is one that is really uh, pushed throughout a lot of the U.S., Canada, and, and I also believe South, uh, um, also in the, the, the southern U.S. And, and you begin seeing this, this aging that's happening. And again, it's not a fatigue, but it's, but it's more localized in the surface to where this material is just uh, not durable. And then I go up north. And I see more thermal, or if I put the improper grade down in the south, you would see the thermal cracks there too. Now let's look at rutting. Um, on my next slide, let's let's look at, and see what's happening there. And, and if I began to look at at rutting and moisture damage and raveling, those are other distresses. Uh, moisture damage, uh, rutting, we know happens if I if I become unstable. Moisture damage is important to understand the chemistry that's happening between the aggregate and the asphalt. Some, some asphalt will not stick to some rocks. Um, raveling uh, can also be very similar to that. And raveling can also happen when I have an under asphalted mixture or improper compaction. And naturally any of these distresses can be accelerated with that. So volumetric designs, and I have, a, and, and if you joined us on that first webinar, we talked a lot about uh, the volumetrics and we talked about the phase diagram. Well, volumetrics 
it is simply a way to allow us to, to balance the volumes of materials to make sure that we're that we're that we're uh, getting the proportions correct. Now we have put a lot of effort, and I mean, there's a lot of uh, PhDs out there who have who have um, got their certificates and, and got their degrees based upon being very good with volumetrics, and there's not a, nothing wrong with that. But again, it's it's one it's one step, uh, and and like anyone uh, would recognize, there's limitations that come with volumetric design. We cannot solely rely everything on air voids. However, that's all the talk that we've had for years. So what do we what happens there? If I if I rely heavily on on air voids and mineral aggregates, um, and I begin to look at volumetrics, <clears throat> what happens is I begin to add different rounded materials or what about if i take a crushed material that's crushed on two faces and round on one the other side um volumetrics can't really pick up on that uh bma is only accurate as the bulk gravities and you see other things i have in there and the recycle components and so on again there's many lot limitations to volumetrics volumetrics is a good starting point now the next thing that's important is to talk about binder quality as i began to look at at, at binder uh, we know that binder has changed and, we, and we've heard a lot about um, the news in the past year that we were going to be seeing um, because of the, uh, the the change in the in the fuel oils we were going to be seeing more sulfur uh, or not just more sulfur but more asphalt uh, being produced which would end up uh, supposedly lowering the price uh, that would be uh, that's great as that continues to happen to to help us on our uh, build uh, build more roadways if that's possible, but but what does that do at the end result? Well, it still meets the binder is still going to meet the the minimum quality that Superpave has spelled out. But there may be things there that we just can't uh, measure in in a in rheometry or in a what they call a DSR, a, a dynamic shear rheometer, or in a bending beam rheometer. Uh, binder content plays a big role in the performance. And again, that rheometry that we talk about helps us to understand the rutting and the cracking components. But again, this is only one measure. The real, the real change happens in the next slide, which helps us to understand how all of these components go together. Now, I mix the asphalt and I mix it with the aggregate. And Everything was good in the early 2000s, but then we find out our gyrations levels are a little bit high. We knew they were high to begin with, but they were up there to help us not fail and as we were trying to, to keep a nation from having roads that would rut. Why was rutting important to solve? Rutting, rutting in a roadway causes this channel, as you know, and water pools in it causes hydroplaning, which can result in fatalities. We can live with cracks. We cannot live with rutting on a roadway. We can seal a crack. You can't seal a rut. You have to either mill or or fill uh, that rut. We also uh, so now we're backing that off. We're looking at lowering design air voids. Uh, Kentucky here alone is moving from about a 4.0 to about a 3.5. Uh, in addition to uh, that's a air voids that is in addition to lowering gyration levels. Um, and again, that's playing with volumetrics in order to get the end result they want on the performance side. Uh, reduction in recycle materials, uh, encouraging more of the blending charts to understand what the final product is. Uh, additives, uh, another, there's another changing, the polymers, the worn mix, and the, the aramid fibers we're going to hear about today. And how does that affect all of this? Uh, one nice thing there, just a plug on the aramid fibers, is it does not change your mix design. It does not change your, your volumetrics at all. It does, however, give you a big boost on the performance side. So again, aramid fiber is something you would never pick up in volumetrics. Um, again, modifications to superpave again is the balanced mix design we're talking about. So again, balanced mix design goes beyond just analyzing the volumetrics. We add on the balance between durability and stability. Joe, I do a lot of hiking, and and one thing I have uh, I've enjoyed seeing. As, I, as I've gone out hiking, is you'll see people that actually build the stones that we that you just saw there with the balancing it. And it's amazing some of the things that people will build. And as a as a, as a hiker, you go through, and one of your deals there is to go through and, and add a stone to it. Um, 
And, and some of these things they build like that just amaze me. And I haven't seen this one yet, but maybe that's one that I'll work on as I get on a trail and can get back out sometime. Okay, so what tests are available? Uh, we've got everything um, from the high-end stuff to, to more of the, of the simplistic. Now I say simplistic, uh, they're not all that simple, but some are more simple than others. So if I'm going to look at cracking, and again, I'm very, uh, I'm using a very generic term for cracking, because I know we have thermal cracking, we have thermal fatigue, we have that can introduce the block cracking, we have uh, the, the higher strain fatigue for reflective cracking, we have lower strain fatigue that we, we look at the bottom up cracks, we, and on and on and on. But these are just different tests that we can use here from the ideal CT, which you see in the top right, which also is the same jig we would use for any uh, IDT type of test or TSR test. The, the middle picture there is the uh, SCB test that you see. And then of course, not pictured the DCT and we also are not picturing the overlay, but we are picturing uh, the bending beam fatigue test. Now, one thing you can look at uh, is an SVECD. Now that's a lot of letters there, but that's a, that's a, it's, it's a, it's a higher level test and it's a very good test where I can actually glue my ends of my sample and now I can begin to, to, to measure uh, in a pulling mechanism or an attention mechanism, measure the fatigue of, of a sample there using, a, using an AMPT device. For rutting, um, there's, again, I could use my AMPT device to, to measure things such as flow number or what you're seeing come online uh, more practical is is the asphalt pavement analyzer and Hamburg wheel tracker. Now the one pictured there on the left is one that I have in my lab. Uh, Joe, what you cannot see is if the lid was closed, you would see a Batman symbol on it. Uh, love to have some fun with that and uh, here in the here in the bat lab. So let's move on now and talk about the, the theory and the approach of how we're how we're doing this with, with balanced mix design. So I think Zach's going to have to get uh, himself some Robin stickers. That's just all there is to it. So, <laughs> well, that's that's funny. Yeah, Zach reminds me that he's the real Batman, and I'm just I'm just the uh, old gray uh, bearded um, Alfred. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about the theory and approach of what we're doing today. So, so what I want to to mention is a little bit of the history of the mixed design in, in this. And, and without going into a lot, right? Natural sand really limited us. Why, why do we have 4% air voids? Why, where in the world did that come from? Uh, that was a subjective value that we found that worked well with our mixtures. If I, if I go much below that, my mixture would become unstable. If I go above it, my mixture is, uh, uh, now I've got too much air in it. And a matter of fact, I was doing that very thing in my lab uh, this week. And we went right down uh, pretty low with a little bit of natural sand. And it went, became very unstable. The moment I pull out my natural sand, I can take my air voids uh, down very, very low. And matter of fact, I've done designs at 1% without that. So crushed materials allow us to go lower. Uh, and that's the example I was given there with an in, in, uh, the inner layer. Again, binder specification, is, as we've seen, is lacking. And that's something to realize, too, is that with the binder specification lacking, what I mean is that Binder, uh, there's no test in there that helps us to understand adhesion, and there's no and the and the fatigue parameter, what they call the PAV DSR test, uh, is not really. Uh, it's good for mod for unmodified materials, but not really helping us for where we're at today. So again, it comes down to again in basic form here a balance between rutting and cracking. In the 40s. We did have some early tests, as you see there at the stability test, whether it was a Hubbard field or beam stability. Um, when I first started out, we were using Marshall stability and flow. And those tests were good and they got us to where we are today. And matter of fact, if I look back at the beam stability, it's a great triaxial test. The, the issue with it, and I, and I love the test, but the issue with it is the equipment was really hard and, and difficult and still is to calibrate. Uh, today, if I go and look, you know, I've, I've got so many tests that we can use out there today. And which one's right for you? Uh, which one is the one test we're going with in America? Um, there's not one. Uh, we're we're uh, tending to adapt um, to to what works for us. If you had to pick sort of the top two tests, it's probably the ideal CT for most of the states until you go north. And then in the north, you're seeing more DCT or some SCB. 
in the and then but most everybody is moving to um, a Hamburg uh, type of setup where I can do wet rut testing, which also gives me a uh, a TSR value or a stripping value. A TSR is a static test. The Hamburg is a dynamic test, so it's going to pick up on stripping better than what a TSR ever could do for. So a lot of a lot of good things that's coming out for. So the basics hey, of performance Paul. testing. Yes, Joe. I think an interesting point here um, in everything that we've learned together, uh, you know, looking at these additive technologies, uh, I think a real important point for all listening is those uh, four or three tests uh, back in the 40s, they would not have necessarily picked up on the performance enhancements that, uh, you know, our product or others are doing today. And that's why these newer tests are so, so uh, critical to getting us to balance mix design, correct? Uh, that's right. You know, Marshall stability and flow may have picked up on it a little bit. Hubbard field stability <laughs> may have if you'd have gotten past the air, but you're exactly right, Joe. And, you know, in, in summary, you know, the balance uh, performance testing, what it does, it, it allows us to verify estimates, check our distresses that could happen in the lab, that could happen in the field, but we'll check them in the lab. Do custom designs, maybe for truck stops, maybe for extra loaded areas such as tollway areas, uh, and so on. And the data allow us to think out of the box with new materials and modifiers. So again, fundamental test, we, we, we talked about uh, some more generic ones here uh, earlier, or I guess what I call more uh, everything from fundamental to index. What you're looking at here are very fundamental tests, whether it's beam fatigue or things such as dynamic modulus, uh, indirect tension or low temperature creep and the with the extensometers that you see on the far left picture with the green gauges those gauges are very expensive gauges um, you're, you're looking at uh, four to five thousand dollars just for a set of gauges for a sample but they allow us to measure at very very um, uh, um, small levels of movement do we need that for everything that we're doing on production no but we need this in the laboratory and then we naturally have to move that out to the to the field um, the DCT is, is sitting down there on the bottom in a test I absolutely love and one that really helped us to, to move forward to help us understand uh, fracture energy. So on the rutting side, or I'm sorry, on the, um, uh, let's move on there, Joe. When I began to look at what I call index test, an index test is just that. It may not relate perfectly to rutting or perfectly to cracking, but it gives us an indicator of a go, no go. Now I can still get, get some relationship. And I know if I put, you know, more crushed materials in, I see uh, less rutting, but it, it's not as fine tuned, but these tests are perfect to help us move forward on a, on a field level. And, and that's why that we, we're trying to move forward with such as SCBI fit, ideal CT, uh, the overlay crack tester, APA, Hamburg wheel tester, and so on. On a study that we did in Kentucky uh, early on, back in 2010, we found out if we added asphalt to a mixture, um, it could sit there and take a, a large amount of asphalt. Now the mixture became more compactable, but what we found out is that compacting with the same air voids, we couldn't get that mixture to even move until we we got uh, until we added a half percent asphalt or five tenths uh, five tenths asphalt. And so what you really what you would look at there is that mixture was nowhere near being balanced. Sometimes you see these curves uh, go a little different way, but I'm just showing you here the curve was pretty flat even after adding a half percent asphalt. Um, I would challenge you though that this mixture at half percent more asphalt is much better than what you had before. It is more compactable. You do have more glue. These tests may not pick up on it, but if you threw it in something such as a, a Cantabro or a Catabro test that you call it, you'd find out you have better adhesion. So let's go look at what the theory is on this one and, and what they call the plan. And this is going to show you the stability curve uh, starting out really high and the durability being really low. Now, if you look at the bottom, that's I'm looking at asphalt content as I move left to right. Now, as I move to the middle, you see, you see that balance coming together, just like I demonstrated in, with real data. Uh, and now, as I move to the right, my durability picks up. My cracking uh, is more is is more a mixture is more crack resistant. However, I begin to lose stability if I go too high. 
So what they consider looking at in the balance is being right in the middle where I can have good stability, good durability without sacrificing those, those two uh, categories. So we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to do a quick overview here, and I mean a quick overview of the ideal CT test, and then we're going to do a quick overview of the, of the Hamburg test. Ideal CT, and Joe, I'm just going to ask you to keep up with me on these slides. Um, uh, ideal CT is a simple uh, monotonic test where I'm, where I'm going to load that sample, and as I load the sample, I'm going to begin to gather this curve that you see here, and I'm going to take the energy under that curve that you're looking at there, and then dividing that energy by that slope. The reason it's important to divide it by that slope is again, this is an index test uh, because I'm not truly getting the real fracture energy by pulling the sample apart directly. I'm doing it indirectly. <laughs> Joe's pointing out my, I think it's a my Batman symbol there, Joe. Um, yeah. As I and so this test is one that we're that that a lot of folks are moving forward with. Now, if I look at the SCB, SCB does the same thing, different. Uh, same type of curve that you're going to see and just a, uh, a different specimen uh, um, setup. Uh, if I began to look at the background, I'm going to focus here just on ideal CT. Um, again, similar to the, to the indirect tension test that we're using, but unlike the TSR, we're going to go beyond the peak load with this. Still moving at 50 millimeters a minute, and for simplicity, we're just using samples that's compacted to 62 millimeters in height. Now, I would tell you, you want to go a little thicker than that, once you get into three quarter inch mixtures and, and, and larger. So as I began to crack the sample, as you see here, as I move and I'm, these slides are borrowed from Fuji, uh, Fuji Zhao down at Texas A&M and appreciate all of Fuji's hard work on this and, and moving this uh, through the ASTM committees to get this test out there for us. Um, there's a lot of work to be done on the test, but this test has given us so many, uh, so much good feedback. Now, Fuji runs it at 25C. In Kentucky, we're going to run it at probably 25C2 with a little different limit. But if you go in Ohio, you may see them running it at like a 21C or lower. Look at the crack that begins to form in stage four. That's that blue line that's drawn in there. And then in, in stage five. And by the time you hit stage six, which is not listed, I can begin to pull that sample apart with my hands if it doesn't just fall off. Hey, Phil, before we move yes. forward, uh, uh -huh. discuss a little bit about the aging protocol and how important it is for ideal CT. Yeah, I'll, I'm going to get to that, Joe. Okay, mm -hmm. good. Yeah, absolutely. So the ideal scope here is, again, um, I'm going to try to use, uh, I, I want to just understand basic cracking resistance of a test. Now, if I really want to uh, make it more generic, what I'm really trying to do is I'm looking for the peak strength but then after my pavement forms that initial crack, how does it propagate or how does that crack move on? And, and that's where mixture cohesion and adhesion really begins to work together. And how am I holding that mixture together to keep that crack from growing? So mixture cohesion and adhesion is something we don't talk about a lot about and we sure don't measure until lately. The ideal of this, the, the ideal CT test, I like it because again, no cutting, no trimming, no gluing. And, and again, I'm just targeting a typical air void density that I would try to match in the field. Now, um, all I'm doing here is again, I'm taking a, a standard braking head, applying a constant load, and it's gonna be recorded. There's several different pieces of equipment out there that can do that. And I'm gonna have Joe bring those up. But I'm gonna, some of these will automatically calculate it and others you have to hand calculate. But most of these I think are, are, are automatic on how they'll calculate it today. Um, there on the left is the device that we have, and that is a, uh, that's the uh, Instratex. They call it the Auto SCB, but the Auto SCB frame can test anything from an SCB to uh, standard IDT to ideal CT. And you, then you see Pines equipment and, um, and then a, a, the smart jig down there on your, on your bottom right. And, there, and there's other pieces of equipment out there. Um, we're going to see if we can make this video uh, work, Joe. And it may or may not, but if the video won't work, that's that's just fine. So what would what would what would happen is as this as this sample begins to move, there we go. As the sample begins to move and break, and hopefully everybody can see that. Um, nothing too exciting. Uh, you're going to see that sample push apart. So again, by imparting the load vertically, I'm forcing tension in the middle of the sample. Now I'm not sure. This me, I'm not sure I like the plates the way that, that it's working here because I'm I'm tending on soft samples to punch the top. So that may be something the technologist, we use technologists may need to look at 
to, un to, to, to keep this from denting uh, the top of the sample and and get more of a uh, more of a true um, uh, tension in the middle but anyway things that we have to work on okay um, always like to say that there's research recommended so how do you design a mix that is stable um, or durable let's take a quick look at that and here um, this is just showing you sensitivity to the ideal uh, CT and and what Fuji did here is he took laboratory mixes and and aging is important and i'm gonna say a couple of things on aging here fuji did four hour aging on everything that he has done and the reason the aging is important aging not only allows absorption of the ag of the asphalt into the aggregate but the aging or the extended heating of that mixture of conditioning as it should be called also um, will will age the binder itself, which is important. And then thirdly, and very, very important, it releases the wrap, it releases the binder from the wrap or the RAS. You will not see that in one hour. You will not see that in two hours. And and but by you by the more that you age it, the more you'll see that wrap release. That's the kicker that's really hard for DOTs to wrap their hand around arms around in, in order to try to match field with laboratory and and I really see for C going forward as a as a lab design and a and a field uh, and then a field acceptance value that may end up being a little higher so again important to always uh, even though it takes longer guys it's important to make sure we we condition properly okay so what we did here is uh, Fuji just simply added a uh, wrap and ran wrap RAS and you see the ideal CT values drop there's no reason to uh, to keep to keep on this, and you see the parameters there. I'm just going to move through these next slide pretty quickly. Um, he he used different uh, asphalt types here, going from a minus 22, softened it to a 28, softened it to a 34. Um, this is a 34 more crack resistant. Absolutely, it is, and the test absolutely picked it up, and it should have because the mixture becomes more compliant. Uh, or again, at that temperature, it's it's, it's still adhesive and cohesive. Um, now, OAC stands for optimum asphalt content. And so Fuji took that same number, at, at, at Joe had his laser there on in the middle, and he went a half percent below, a half percent asphalt below, and then a half percent above. And look what happens. We can go from a 60 to about 160, all the way up to 250. And I'm seeing that in my laboratory too. Uh, I actually saw values uh, uh, pushing in the 300 range here in, in Kentucky. Now, it was not very stable, uh, because it would not meet the rutting side, but I was able to push up to 300. Um, and uh, so, yeah, asphalt makes a big difference on that. Here's the aging component. So four hour may be my standard aging, but what happens, and notice here, we did change to a 7022 with an optimum asphalt content here of 6.3. Notice what happens when I go 12 hour aging and 24. Why in the world would I ever want to do that? Well, let's walk before we run and get the four hour stuff down first. But is there a point where I ever want to design maybe with 12 hour aging or 18 or 20 hour aging, even 24? Absolutely, because that's going to pick up on some of the effects of the rehab of rehab or other uh, recycled uh, products that may break down over time that we need to look at. Again, let's walk before we run on this. OK, um, last slide on, on how we begin to correlate and begin to look at, at how it performs in the field. What you're looking at on the left is is cracking uh, on the on the left axis, and then on the bottom is months open to traffic. The red one represents a wrap ras mix in Texas. Again, from this is from Fuji and and company down there at A and M. And then the uh, the bottom line over there represented just a, a virgin mix or one that had no wrap or ras in it. So it naturally crack had better cracking or less cracking. Look at the wrap ras mix over here on the ideal CT, and then look at the virgin mix. Look at the difference in the two. So real life, we can we can predict it in a laboratory, and that's just one data point. Again, uh, not to not to uh, extend this out too long, but mix improvements as begin as we begin to look at cracking resistance, we've got to optimize the binder between stability and durability. Like I said, I've made one that's really durable, but it was really unstable in the laboratory here. Um, more binder promotes more crack resistance. Uh, Increasing Boyd's field with asphalt 
uh, doing stuff such as lowering your dust to asphalt ratio or your dust proportion is going to help you um, and so on. Now let me show you some work we did here with the airman fiber. Guys, when I first started out and, and, and I laughed with Joe and Steve on this, I always said there is absolutely no way that the aramid fiber, uh, I, I didn't expect much from it. I thought it's another fiber and here it comes again. Well, I was surprised because I didn't realize I was dealing with a, with a polymer fiber and it's a whole different beast than what fibers that we, we looked at years ago. So here you see, as I began to put a single dose in and a double dose in a, in a standard uh, 70 uh, 64 and then over in the right is a 70 mixture. As I did this with my 6422, I went from a 90 up to about a 130 on an ideal CT. And then I did the same when I went with a 7022. Uh, I was uh, I was down there in, in the in the um, 80 range, and then adding that double dose took me even higher. Why is that? Because the binder reacts very well with this aramid fiber, and and you need that to hold it in place. Joe, on the on the Hamburg that I'm going to mention here, I just want to just hit a few slides. Most folks are familiar with this. Let's just go through just a handful of slides here. Again, um, let's skip that one. Uh, these are just pictures of standard equipment. Uh, I would refer you to Ashto T324. And again, on this one, uh, we, don't, we do not age to four hours, we're aging to two. Why is that? Worst case scenario for rutting is less aging. Uh, you do have to make a little trim on this sample here, as you see, to butt these two samples together. Again, 62 millimeters tall, and you're making them to 7% air voids. Uh, this is just going over the conditioning procedure. Um, and now, one thing that I like to do today is instead of just using the standard uh, rutting and then stripping inflection point, uh, there's some other things that, that I do that I want to look at, and I want to I want to hit a few slides. So one thing is a stripping inflection point. If that value begins to happen below 10,000, uh, there's there's work out there by Tim Ashenbrenner of Colorado DOT that really uh, alerts you to stripping that can happen. If you see something that's happening around 4,000, you have a real issue. Um, again, there's two things happening in this test. One is rutting and the other one's stripping. And this test doesn't care which one happens. It just makes them both happen if it can. Um, and man, when it goes, it goes. Okay, uh, a new way to look at this is there's a thing called an RRI. And one thing that I like with the RRI is, I, is I'm able to take uh, a value, let's say if I run everything out to 20,000 passes and one of them has 10 millimeters of rutting and the other one has, has uh, four millimeters of rutting. Normally I would say they both perform. Well, I need to be able to rank those. So RRI allows us to simplify this performance by doing this. I simply take, and we're going to bring up the next one that has my my formula. You simply, and this is a work that was that I referenced here, um, uh, that was uh, that's published in TRB. You simply take your number of passes times one minus your rut depth, where your rut depth is in inches. And what that does is it just gives you an index, and it, and it helps you to do what I'm getting ready to show you here. So now, just wrap your head around this: a higher RRI is more rut resistance. And that's what you're looking at on the bottom. On the left, I'm taking a higher CT is better, an, an ideal CT. And so these are some values that I put together. So that red box says, I want to be in the performance zone. If I took that same 6422 and 7022 that I had before and look at them by themselves, neither one end up in that box. When I put the aramid fiber into them, both of those go into the box. Now, while the blue dot is all that I need, the red dot may be something I want to use at a truck stop, for instance, because it gives me a higher level of performance. Um, or maybe because of what it's doing on the on the CT index, maybe I want that more on a, on a road where I'm just trying to resist uh, more cracking because of underlying cracking issues. With that, um, Joe, I'm going to kick it over to you and, um, and uh, looking forward to taking over for you here. And I'm going to help answer some of the chats. And if you would, Joe, take it away. And again, thank you everybody for joining us today. Joe, if you can hear me, I think you're on mute or something's not working. Yes, I was. And thank you very much, everybody. And Phil, thanks so much for going through uh, the balanced mix design and the introduction. And I think it'll 
uh, really kind of shine through here on, on the rest of today. So uh, kind of switching gears just a minute, uh, we're going to go ahead and, and launch another uh, poll question. Um, and, uh, you know, the question becomes, why is aramid polymer fiber a perfect choice for asphalt pavement reinforcement? So it's just kind of changing our gears here for a little bit. And let's see here. It should be open. There we go. Okay, now we're starting to get some folks. Uh, okay, so uh, why is it uh, the perfect? Is, uh, is it a tool for balanced mix design? We'll see. Is it lightweight, low volume product, no absorption, high temperature resistance? Maybe it's all of the above. I don't know. Let's see what everybody says. We only have 32% voting. Come on, folks. Let's go. Joe, uh, a few things while they're voting here. Um, I noticed that there was a lot of comments uh, earlier early on, uh, back around 115, having problems voting. So again, the voting's working. There may be issues with, with WebEx and that's out of our control. So hopefully that's working now. And, yeah. um, and so I'm gonna begin answering some of those questions now as you continue on, Joe. Okay, great. So let's uh, close this and uh, share the results. And uh, there we go. So uh, a little bit of teaser there, uh, you know, I did say uh, it is a, a tool for balanced mix design, but in reality, uh, this is why aramid fiber is such an awesome tool because all of the above apply. And so uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started uh, this afternoon on uh, the rest of this. Easy for me to do here. Let's see. Hi, there we go. Okay, here we go. All right. So, Phil, I think you can take over now the polls. You got it? Yep, I'll take it from here on the polls. You go right ahead, Joe. All right, here we go. So, we're going to jump right into uh, the rest of the presentation here. And I'm going to turn off my highlighter. So today's agenda, we just went through balanced mix design. We are going to walk through the remainder of this, starting with what is the good, better, best, and test program. Well, to kind of build on where Phil was today, um, he was talking about the uh, items in SuperPave that we would manipulate, if you will, from a volumetric side uh, to help with balanced mix design. I kind of look at it a little different and I call it a toolbox and, and I'm going to call it uh, the easy button. Some easy things that we can do both from a volumetric standpoint and maybe even some additives uh, to be used in order to significantly change the performance of the mix design uh, we're looking at. And of course, one of the, the cornerstone of all of this is going to be this performance testing. The, the very thing that Phil walked through today on Ideal CT in Hamburg, primarily being two easy ways uh, to run tests and get a really good idea of just how that asphalt is performing. You know, once you have that indicator, that, uh, that initial indicator of your, let's say your, your control mix, you can start playing with things and see what it does in order to uh, improve cracking or improve rutting. And some of those things here are, as Phil mentioned earlier, one of the most important items in asphalt performance is the amount of liquid virgin binder that's going in and how you account for your wrap and racks. Uh, he talked about lower air voids. He talked about removing dust. Uh, all of those things are kind of easy to do in the volumetric side of things, and but they have huge ramifications to the overall design. But I'll tell you, uh, playing with those uh, will only get you so far. And that's why the use of plant delivered additives, as I have mentioned here, the aramid reinforcing fibers, or maybe even some liquid binder modifiers make sense. This is how we put together the good, better, best, and test program. Keeping these items in our toolbox in mind, we set some goals for ourselves. And this, this program is something that we share with 
any of our potential customers or all of our existing customers. We want everybody to know how crack resistant their roadways are today. It's data that's missing. So many uh, engineers, owners, uh, DOTs know they have a cracking problem, but they haven't had an easy way of really identifying what it is or measure it to give themselves a baseline to then get in and fix it. It's always kind of been tweak uh, the design, put it down for five to seven years and see if it works. We don't have to do that anymore. We've got some great indicators here with both Ideal CT and Hamburg to get us there. So the first goal of the program is to create engineering data to understand the current mix design. And then to use some of these tools that we have, uh, hit this easy button and start playing with that mix in the lab and see where we can get those mix designs to go. If our goal was to improve cracking, great. Let's, uh, let's add a little bit more asphalt. Let's add some uh, aramid fiber and let's see what we can get done. But there's some tools in our toolbox that we can use to very easily get there. The second part of this, and it's most important, not all solutions should, uh, to a problem should be treated the same way. And the true is to be said even with our product, okay? So once you improve that mix design and you have it quantified as to how crack resistant it might be, the deal then should be you should marry that design to the problem that you're trying to solve. So not all problems should be addressed the same way. And this is where the good, better, best solution comes in. And you're gonna see this throughout the presentation today. So surface tech, single dose of ACE XP polymer fiber. You heard Phil reference both the single and double dose earlier. A single dose of our product is 4.2 ounces of ACE XP polymer fiber per ton of plant mix asphalt. That is a pretty good solution, just doing that. If you double that dose, it's actually a much better solution. And then if you take uh, what we've learned through the good and better, we went on to the drawing board and created this army inner layer, which you're gonna hear a lot about today. Um, and then adding an ACE XP uh, fiber surface course to that, that's the best solution you can put out there. Now, is that, where, is that gonna be your everyday solution? Maybe not, but you're gonna marry that to your worst problem. That's what we're trying to accomplish. So let's get started. What is ACE XP polymer fiber? ACE XP polymer fiber from a high level is a proven technology that increases the strength, crack resistance, rut resistance, fatigue, life, toughness, and service life of any asphalt concrete mixture. Our goal today for this segment is to prove that value proposition to you. And I think at the end of today, you're gonna to have an opportunity to vote on that. And I think you're going to uh, uh, vote yes. So let's get moving. So what exactly is the product? The product is actually uh, the combination of two parts, aramid fiber, which we call the active ingredient, and sassabit wax, which we call the inactive ingredient. Uh, they're uh, combined in equal parts, so 50-50, 50% aramid fiber, 50% sassabit wax. And it comes together to create uh, the bundles of fiber that are wax coated on the right-hand side of the right-hand picture. So as you can see, 2.1 ounces to 4.2 ounces of aramid plus 4.2, uh, excuse me, 2.1 to 4.2 ounces of, of sassabit wax gives you a single dose of 4.2 ounces to a double dose of 8.4 ounces. Now, the interesting thing is, and, and Phil, you can comment on this if you would, uh, all of our testing that we've done, we've actually gone up to what, six times the dose and went back and ran the volumetrics and it, it still changes nothing, correct? Yeah, that's that's right, Joe, and uh, not changing volumetrics at all. And although there is a surface area with this, it's just not affecting the volumetrics at all. Hey, Joe, there was a lot of feedback on here on, um, I, again, we just, and I don't know if there's anything you can fix it on your end, that what everybody's seeing is they're seeing the presenter's view versus the main view. So they're seeing where it's queuing up the next slide and everything in the notes view. Um, I don't know if you really? can fix, yeah, I don't know if you can fix that or not. Uh, but uh, again, that may be, that may just be an issue with WebEx right now. So, um, 
Um, anyway, just to, oh, there it how goes, about, Joe. How about whatever, now? Whatever you did, you just fixed it. Well, golly, geez, we're only halfway through. I'm glad we got that finished. Uh, there we go. Uh, we're fixed. Yeah, thank Thanks you. so much. I appreciate that. And uh, so let's go forward here. So, um, so Aramid Fiber, okay, there's two main manufacturers in the world um, that control about 80% of the Aramid Fiber production. Uh, that's Tejen, uh, which is the largest, a, a Danish company. And then uh, DuPont, uh, which is uh, really a U.S. company. The trade names for DuPont is Kevlar, which most people know, and for Tejin is Tuaron. And so uh, those manufacturers uh, both make a product that fit uh, the description of the raw aramid that we use in our product. Uh, so let's talk about uh, ASEXP just for a minute. And that it's a plant blended asphalt additive. So important to point out, it is not terminally blended. It is actually brought out to the plant every single time. Uh, and then that service is part of the, the sale of the product goes into the plant uh, to uh, in, in the dose that you choose and uh, provides that uh, instantaneous uh, uh, reinforcement. So you can turn it on and turn it off very quickly. It's an inch and a half long uh, bundle. Those bundles are 12,000 fibers uh, coated with wax. So that gives you about 10 million of those individual fibers per ton of asphalt. And as you can see below, that's 400,000 PSI tensile strength of those fibers. So you're putting a lot of tensile strength into a product asphalt that tends to not have a lot of uh, tensile strength. And it goes in in a three-dimensional manner. The wax melts at 170 degrees, which then releases all those fibers in the mixing drum. The wax becomes fully soluble in the liquid binder. You'll never see it again. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, no change in mix design and or the laydown process. And another real important issue is because we're adding it, it doesn't mean that you have to add extra liquid binder. Again, we're not changing the, the JMF. Uh, we are actually uh, going to strengthen strengthen that liquid binder that, that's in there. And if you notice, uh, one of the other good matching features is we're 932 melting. So that fiber can withstand the high temperatures that are within a mixing drum. You know, we all know what Kevlar is in a lot of cases. These are some of the uses around the globe for that product. Uh, everything from ballistic protection, our, our fire suits, uh, our uh, heat and cut protection. And really, Airmid's taken, uh, taken root in just about anything that was being expected to be reinforced with steel at one point. Airmid is slowly taking that over. So it is a high performance man-made fiber suitable for just about any challenging application you can think of. And because of its high temperature resistance and because of its high tensile property and also high modulus, this product gets into the mix, uh, creates a three-dimensional structure with those 10 million fibers and really gives you uh, a full depth reinforced asphalt section. So you're not trying to reinforce it from the bottom with a fabric or a grid, you're actually reinforcing that entire depth of your asphalt overlay or full depth pavement, whichever you decide to use it in. So if you look at it under the microscope, you'll see that as it tosses in the drum, um, the stone will, uh, I call it bruising, but create these fibrils. Those fibrils root into the liquid binder. And of course, the surface area out of the fiber itself is going to come in contact with that liquid binder. The length of the fiber becomes really important because it allows it to entangle around some of the smaller granules, which also locks it into place much better. So the, the end result, and I'm gonna tease you guys a little bit. Hey Joe, um, yeah. Um, just, to, just to interrupt again for our audience here, um, we are still seeing your uh, dashboard now. So where it says your audience view and uh, the poll question stats, uh, all of that is still being shown, believe it or not. And uh, yeah, it just, uh, and folks, we really apologize. WebEx has greatly changed um, their controls and has thrown us for a loop. So uh, uh, sorry about that, but Joe, go right ahead. It, oh, that, that looks good, Joe. Is that better? Yes. All right. well, that's weird. Okay. So, um, I'm going to tease everybody here and say, okay, so what does the product do when you put it in? 
Uh, most of us on the phone are going to be uh, familiar with uh, the performance grade binder chart. And let's just say we're going to start uh, our mix with a uh, 6422 binder. And when you add a single dose, 4.2 ounces of aramid fiber or ASEXP polymer fiber to that mix, the mix is going to end up performing more like a 7028. So you're going to get, a, if you will, a bump in binder performance on both the top and on the bottom. And if you think about that, now you're protecting uh, or providing performance in a wider range of temperature zones, and you're going to drive that cracking, cold weather cracking, six degrees colder. So at the end of the day, that's just one dose. And, and you know, when you get into two doses, it even gets better than that. So there, there's a little teaser there for what our product does. So when we apply good, better, best, and test, the first thing we say is, you know, improving performance is a choice. But if you don't know what your existing mix design is testing at, both in cracking and rutting, it's kind of hard to get into the lab and apply some of these things, both on balanced mix design and our good, better, best, and test program. So the key to this is truly getting into the lab and understanding your cracking and your running potential of your existing mix. Now, as we go through this, I'm going to share some things about our product. Uh, we're going to start on cracking. And uh, as Phil mentioned, here's the major uh, crack tests uh, that are available today. Uh, the easiest and, and, and uh, uh, let's say, less expensive test to run right now that is really giving good correlation back to SCB, put some correlation ties back to DCT, uh, anyway, the, the ideal CT is where we've landed on. But I, what I want everybody to understand is, as Phil mentioned earlier, these tests are used for various reasons. And, and we have, in fact, run them all. There is not one test that we haven't run. So when we say 30 to 50% improvement in crack performance, it's because every one of those tests have come back and shown that. So we feel comfortable and moving away from some of the more complicated tests that only certain people can run that are very expensive to landing on ideal CT. And uh, so just as a re uh, reminder, here's the test, here's how we're gonna run it. Uh, so the, the, the first thing is to, is to know how your existing mix performs in this test. And some of the values that uh, Dr. Fujizawa set are here in the table early on and these will move around a little bit depending on where you are in in the country and bill you were working with uh with fuji on that how's that coming the regional uh, look at the uh, the ct index around the country oh yes um matter of fact uh the national center for asphalt testing ncat down in um, down in auburn uh, they have now done uh, quite a bit of work on on uh, ruggedness testing and now that's being added to the standard. I, I, I actually had a chance here in this lab to, to begin doing some testing in warmer climates where we've actually tested at 35C. Uh, I've got a lot of faith in this test, Joe, and, and Fuji continues to work on this in addition to a, what he calls an ideal RT for rutting too. So, so far, okay. so good, Joe. Yeah, so as we look at this and, and the original uh, document and some of the guidelines that were presented were for uh, mixes down in Texas. and. You know, the dense grade down there, you know, he was suggesting a minimum uh, CT index of 65, uh, a super paved mix that uh, might have more liquid in it, might have more crushed stone in it, a 105. And then you're getting to an SMA, uh, a stone matrix asphalt that has quite a bit more liquid in it. Um, and so from a cracking perspective should do uh, extremely better. There's a 145 and you'll see uh, I've added our army line there, uh, our uh, asphalt reinforced mixed interlayer product, and you'll, you're seeing a minimum ideal CT index of 650. Keep that in mind as we move forward. So I'm gonna walk through some of these uh, ideal CT tests that we've done, uh, three or four of them from around the country. One of them starts uh, from Texas, and we had uh, PaveTex run this for us. Uh, this was actually uh, a text uh, dot mix, uh, a dense grade. Uh, as they call it uh, down there with a 6422, 20% wrap. As you can see uh, on the left, the blue numbers, uh, 
you know, we have an ideal CT of about 55.4. And when we added one dose of uh, the aramid fiber, we went up to 75.5, or about a 36% improvement. Now, think about this for a minute. Their super paid mix uh, in, uh, in Texas actually is a, a 76.22 binder. We don't always associate 76.22 binder with a, a good crack performance. And if there was ever a reason why, you're seeing it. Uh, here on the screen. So you have a 25.1. Now keep in mind, uh, Fuji was suggesting for Texas for that number to be 65. Neither one of these two mixes that we tested out of the lab uh, hit that, uh, that minimum number. Um, and of course, uh, when we added one dose of 38 millimeter ASEXP polymer fiber to that, uh, we got that number to go up uh, nearly 60%. So, you know, here's something to think about. We have a lot of DOTs using 7622 uh, for what they believe to be durability uh, for high traffic on interstates. There's a reason why they're having a lot of cracking going on. This is a great example of that. Okay, so here's another job that we did in Christian County, Kentucky. Uh, Phil, you guys just completed this, I think, last week. Uh, this was a job that went down, I believe, late last year in Kentucky. And this is plant mix. This isn't lab mix. Um, and so the base uh, 6422, uh, I, did, I did not put the binder on there. Shame on me. So it's 6422 binder. And uh, the control uh, of the base mix and the surface mix there is 75.9 and 79.5. What we did is we added uh, the 4.2, which was on the job itself, 4.2 ounces of ACE XP to the surface mix. And you can see how that uh, index grew from 75 uh, up to 118. So about almost a 50% increase. Another job we did over in Missouri. Again, plant made, uh, plant mix. And uh, there you can see the stats of the, the asphalt design there on the screen. And uh, the, the virgin binder grade was a 5828. Uh, the contract grade was 6422 uh, with adding uh, the binder in, or excuse me, the wrap and the RAS in. And uh, you can see the total asphalt content was about 5.4. Now in the scheme of things, 75.5 for the control wasn't bad, but look where we took it, 111.4. Almost, again, that's with a single dose of ACE XP about a 47% increase. So Phil, this is, uh, you know, this really was a, a study that kind of kicked it all off. Uh, it started uh, uh, with the Asphalt Institute and then uh, came over to uh, your lab uh, here and we're continuing uh, to kind of use this uh, mixed design to look at things and compare as we move forward. Um, but this, uh, this was really what we would call our dosing study. What's not on this chart is the all the way up to six times because that's pretty expensive to do. Um, however, what we do have on the chart is the good and better solution. So a 6422, 5.4% uh, uh, AC, uh, no wrap in, in this uh, mix. And, and this was uh, pretty much a, a medium volume road, about a million ESOL, maybe a little bit more than that. Uh, is where this mixed design is used in Kentucky. Came back with a pretty good number. Again, this is a lab mix, so 90.1, but we were still able to improve that with a single dose by 30%. And as you can see, as we get to that second dose, uh, we, we've actually improved at 60%. And so the second step is, is to truly know how um, your control mixes are performing with a single and a double dose of ASEXP polymer fiber. And so uh, another job here, uh, this was in uh, just right outside of Columbus, Ohio, and we did this for the Loves Travel Center. You'll see through this presentation that Loves is, uh, is a preferred uh, uh, client of ours, and they have been using our technology actually since 2015. But uh, we were doing some uh, design work with uh, them and Terracon uh, and uh, trying to help them zone in on maybe how do they manage the polymer binder that they're using? Is there a better way to do it? What happens when they can't get it? So we kind of launched into this study and uh, some of uh, Phil's earlier slides were actually on this job. And so it's a 
6422 uh, versus a, a 7022 modified or if you will polymer modified. As you can see, uh, the, I loaded the, the typical values that we see for those two binders in green. Um, and then the, the measured values are uh, blue and orange. And you can see a 38% increase uh, to typical values. Uh, and then uh, all the way up to 165% increase uh, as we get uh, up to the 7022 double dose. Uh, um, and so you look at this and you say, okay, well, I have a choice now. And quite frankly, it's pretty easy to turn on and off ACE. And looky here, I've, I've uh, really improved my cracking with 6422. Um, maybe I don't need that 7022 because I'm not going to pay for polymer modified and two doses of ACE. I might pay for polymer modified and a single dose of ACE, but holy cow, for the same price, I can have uh, an SCT index of 130 with a double dose of 6422 uh, compared to the 7022 with a single dose of 83. So it's kind of a no-brainer here. Uh, with this particular mix design to say, hey, a single dose um, of 7022 is okay, but I really like that double dose of 6422 for, from a crack uh, saving standpoint. Hey, Phil, what, if you can, why don't you go ahead? Can you launch this or, or not? Yep, uh, there you go, folks. So here is your poll question. Let Joe take a breather there. What could what could you change in a mix design to improve cracking? So in your opinion, um, what would you, um, what could you change in a mix design to improve more cracking? Um, and, and what Joe's doing there, would you add two tenths or 0.2% uh, more liquid virgin binder, 0.2% um, more percent more recycled shingles, 8.4% or 8.4 ounces per ton of ACE polymer fiber or lower the plant production temperatures 20 degrees or both one and three. You hadn't seen that one, Phil. That's pretty snazzy, huh? Yeah, um, good uh, good question there, Joe. We'll, we'll leave that open just for a bit. Joe, here's a, a couple of questions that just came in and really, and some of them I've been answering, this is a more extended one, but you know, is this solution cost effective? Can you support it with studies? Uh, health and safety implications and 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 so on uh, let me answer just a, let me just answer a few of those um and 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 really and, and and that was by jude jude thank you for sending that in uh absolutely it's cost effective the, the beauty of this modifier is you can add it right at the plant so you're not stuck with a tanker load of, of modified uh, material um, cost versus extended life yes there has been studies on that um University of Alberta um, uh, has has done some recent work on that, and uh, they looked at other other fibers too. Uh, also, work that was done out at California, Berkeley, and even other places. Uh, there's there's current work even that's getting ready to start uh, with uh, with New Hampshire. So there's there's quite a bit of work that um, that these guys have worked on uh, throughout the U.S. and and even in Canada. No issues when you mill it. Uh, the the fibers do not cause any health and safety implications at all any issues because they are they are attached to the um, attached to the binder um, concerning the training and 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 QAQC surface tech handles every bit of that uh, you had several more questions in there and what I'll do is I'll just we'll take that offline Jude and I'll have Joe respond to you directly on that but then I'm going to close this poll question and uh, show uh, what everybody uh, uh, came up with, give me just a moment here and I'm gonna share it with everybody now. And as you saw there, uh, most folks chose both one and three, which is the answer. And uh, of course, those who only put the 8.4 ounces per ton of ACE XP, even though that's not the most correct, it, it was the right in the direction and plus Joe will like you for that. So uh, <laughs> with that, uh, I'm gonna close it, Joe, and uh, you take it away. Thanks, Phil, appreciate it. Um, so let's go on, uh, we're gonna move from the cracking side to the rutting side. And again, we're gonna focus on the Hamburg wheel tractor and uh, was not maybe obvious on, in some of uh, Phil's information, but if you were to just look at a PG grade and then expect uh, a certain amount of these uh, uh, wheel passes to go through, 
and create a certain amount of rut depth. This is kind of the guideline. Um, you know, a 50, 5828 is a pretty soft binder. If you're getting 5,000 passes out of that before you achieve a half inch or 12 and a half millimeter rut depth, you're doing pretty good. But look where 7622 is and go back to what Phil was talking about with regards to protecting our highways from rutting. Is there any reason why, uh, is there a reason why they're doing that? Absolutely there is because look at the performance, 20,000 wheel passes to achieve 12 and a half. And it's not uncommon as you're gonna see moving forward for that number to be in the teens uh, with uh, some of our designs that are out there today. So wherever you're at, um, you know, maybe the goal is to take a 6422 and make it perform like a 7622. Um, if we could get that done, we already know that a 6422 way outperforms 7622 and cracking. So let's just kind of walk through this. Now, what I'd like to do is, again, um, we, we've done a lot of testing, both field testing, you're going to see some a little later, uh, lab testing, so forth, so on. Um, and again, no matter the kind of test that's been run, this 30 to 50% improvement per a single dose of, of ACE X2 polymer fiber is what we're seeing. Um, the very earliest test that we ran was a, a project, our very first project in 2014 with the city of Portland. And even though uh, this test was not run to completion, um, it was run well enough to get an idea and this is what, uh, what I sent to Phil when we first started doing testing with him at the Asphalt Institute before he started his own lab. And we started looking at this and we came to the conclusion that, holy cow, we are actually improving the rutting by, it looks like, at least one grade. And as you can see there, the, the, the short orange column uh, with uh, 6422 was tested to 8.2 millimeter rut depth. And it went all the way up to, let's say, 14,000. So it was performing much more like a 7022 than it was a 6422. And then if you look at the 7022 that we put a single dose in, there's your single digits in your millimeters, 5.35. Um, and it's 20,000. Well, shoot, we, we made that 7022 perform more like the expectations of a 7622 but neither one of those tests were taken to absolute failure of 12 and a half millimeters. So that got us you know, thinking early on. And then we had a couple of pilot jobs that went down in Texas uh, early back in uh, uh, 2016. And in Texas, uh, the paving contractors are all required to have Hamburg tests run on every mix design uh, that they put down in the field. So on uh, the mix that's coming out of the plant. And as you can see here, the, the ACE is in, in orange and uh, the control is in blue. This was a 6422. And lo and behold, to get to a minus uh, half inch on the on the, the Y axis or 12 and a half millimeters, we were actually able to provide that with 50, almost 50% 50 more cycles to failure. The second job down, uh, down there was uh, Harris County. This was laid by Century Asphalt. Again, another 6422, and they ran a little bit more detailed analysis, so you can kind of see the rut depth per wheel passes across the top. But again, 12, uh, you know, you go from, you know, 15,000 roughly uh, to 20,000 or 46% improvement in the number of, of uh, wheel passes uh, and, uh, and really performing more like a 7622 because we went all the way out the the 20,000 uh, passes uh, before we actually got to 12 and a half millimeters of rut depth. So we knew that we had something at this point. So I showed you earlier this project from um, Missouri. And so here in the last couple of years, we've been trying to run both uh, as we've rolled this good, better, best and test out to the marketplace. We've been trying to both do the cracking side and the rutting side so we can continue to build our database. Well, um, Mizzou Asphalt uh, uh, Pavement in, in a, I'm gonna say it wrong, Innovation Lab. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bill Butler. Sorry, I just messed up your, the name to your lab. 
Uh, anyway, they ran the rutting. If you recall, we had nearly 50% improvement in cracking performance. Well, here's the rutting side of this. Um, so running Hamburg on that same mixture at 5,000 passes, the control was at 5.2, ACE was at 3.2. At 10,000 passes, the control failed. It was 14.2, and look where the ACE is. It's 4.8. Now, we didn't run it all the way out to 20,000 because all they expected for that rural road was to um, really 5,000 because it's a 58.28, okay? But we actually made that 58.28 perform much, much better from a rutting perspective. Plus, we got 50% cracking. So, you know, the next step in good, better, best is to know once you've zeroed in on a better performing crack mix, you want to go back and rerun it uh, in Hamburg and make sure that you haven't made it too soft to induce uh, additional cracking or additional rutting. What we have found, because we're doing a lot of the modification with the fiber itself, we tend to improve cracking without giving much up in, a, in, in way of uh, rutting. And in a lot of cases, we improve that as well. Okay. So coupled with our in-lab dosing study, as we'll call it, here's, was, uh, here's the full Hamburg study, if you will, all the way up to uh, six times the dose. And uh, the, on the left-hand side, that's uh, ounces of aramid only. So 2.1 ounces all the way to 12.6, and you can see the the number of passes across the screen, uh, across the screen to the to the right. I think it's important to you know as we look at this data, it gives us a sense of what the fiber is doing. And at 15,000 passes, the rut depth was less by 28 to 45 percent, depending on the dosage that you that you were looking at. And Phil, when you ran this, uh, you know, our comment or your comment back to me at that point was, you know, this really wasn't expected to be a great uh, rutting performance uh, uh, product, right? Because it didn't get all the way out to 20,000 in control. And, uh, you know, and so here we are taking something that wasn't really, really great in rutting and making it more acceptable. And so, uh, you know, getting all the way out to total passes at failure we improved that 19 to 32%, again, depending on how much air it's in there. So, you know, all this data is leading us to thinking about what more can we do with our product? And that's gonna come up here very shortly as we uh, move into uh, the next product, which is Army. So the, the other side of the Love's job is, is the rutting side. And if you remember, we uh, drastically improved the cracking performance and made 64.22 look outstanding. Well, the goal was uh, to match the 70.22 performance with a single dose uh, of Aramid to the 64.22. So if you will, you guys can see my, oh, is this back on again? Hey, Phil, can you see that? Uh, Yeah, there we go, Joe. I'm sorry. Uh, go right ahead, Joe. Yeah, I think that was on again. Yeah, so it, the, it, it popped uh, back out on you again, so it's disappeared. The, the, yeah, the goal here is to match this number here, which is a single dose of 7022 uh, to a 6422 with a double dose. And you can see we did that. We made a double dose 6422 um, perform like a single dose 7022. And guess what, guys? That was less expensive for lugs. And uh, it looks like it's going to be less expensive for them overall. So they're going to pick up cracking performance by going to a double dose 6422, or let's say a non polymer version of the, the appropriate binder across the country, as they're looking at uh, you know, a need for maybe polymer's not uh, available or they, they got a cost that was outrageous. They have a, a fallback plan now and they're pretty excited about it. So, you know, with that, I'm going to switch over to Army. Phil, did you have any comments on that? Um, I, I did not at this time, Joe. Um, so um, the product you're getting ready to bring up is one that's near and dear to my heart because uh, it was born out of necessity. 
So uh, go, go right Absolutely. ahead there, Jeff. Yeah, and so you're going going to walk through this with me, and this is uh, this is a product that Phil uh, helped Surface Tech develop, and uh, it was pretty much out of uh, necessity. So let's talk about Army for a minute. What is Army? Army is an aramid reinforced mixed inner layer that's one inch thick. It's and we call it a reflective crack uh, relief inner layer. Easy for me to say, reflective crack relief inner layer, RCRI. And the important thing about this product is it's plant made and paper laid. Um, and it'll improve the cracking resistance of what we would call traditional uh, asphalt mixes by seven or more times as compared uh, to, again, uh, an asphalt that's not developed this way. And as we were putting together good, better, best, and as we were learning more and more about how Aramid affects different mix designs, uh, Phil was actually brought into a project. Phil, I'm, I brought up Taylor County here. Um, and you were brought into this project to help them come up with a 10 to 15 year uh, crack free overlay with no milling. And why don't you talk, uh, talk us through how that all went and because it ties into how we developed on it. Yeah, Joe, so, so what we did was I, there was a project at Taylor County Airport and I was approached by a consultant and they were wanting to use an inner layer over a, um, over a, a lightly cracked asphalt surface. So it was not concrete, but it was lightly cracked asphalt. Um, an inner layer that I had worked on for years, there it is, um, the inner layer I had worked on for years, I was ready to put this down on this project, uh, but what we found out, we were not able to, to get the binder locally. Um, they had tried different means, and this one didn't really call for the elaborate inner layer that I had really um, worked on, and so what we needed was sort of a poor man's version, and uh, and just an intermediate, I shouldn't say poor man's, but an intermediate version. So. Um, quickly um, began to look and then put two and two together and realized that, you know, the aramid fiber is really just a, a form of a polymer and it was locally available and we had to scramble a bit, but they, uh, they pulled up on site, got it introduced in the mixture, made an absolutely beautiful inner layer and a finished product. And actually this product project is act, uh, from what Palmer engineering has said, this project is actually up for an award. So waiting to hear back on that, but uh, ended up with a, uh, beautiful group there with uh, with Hayden Construction that put that down and uh, thank you to uh, the folks at at Palmer for the good aerial photos. Yeah, and right at that time, Phil, we you know as we were putting this together, we were just getting this information back from UCPRC, our friends out at the University of California Berkeley, and they you know they had run some uh, uh, fatigue testing for us using. Uh, you know, the bending beam fatigue uh, test, as I like to call it. This is what really captivated you and moved you into this idea that we could probably even do better than the mix that we put down at Taylor County. So I, I put this in here for you to walk through because this was one of the more fundamental tests that you like to uh, describe asphalt by. So why don't you give the, the, the group a little bit of, on this test and what it really meant to you. Yeah, a, a lot of times what we do is we just look at we just look at um, we talk about a fatigue number and typically it's done at one one strain. Uh, if I'm looking at what's at the bottom of a pavement, it's even way off to the left that you can't even get to. It's probably down uh, below what we would hope would be below 80 micro strain. The moment you start to get up and above 100, you, that's when you begin to see that alligator cracking happen on pavements. Well, a lot of the things that we miss is just general. Uh, brittleness and general fatigue of a pavement that could happen at the surface too and where block cracking happens um, and and that you can begin to see under the tire load uh, believed to be somewhere three four five hundred micro strain once you get up near a thousand you start to approach movement that you could even see on bridge decks and up to two thousand which uh, the the uh, the inner layer I mentioned was even uh, designed at well what these curves do is what's important on this is that the flatter the curve, which you see moving from the black or the dark gray to the, to the light green, the flatter the curve, the more that that product becomes less sensitive to movement in the pavement. If I could have the optimum results, I would have an absolutely flat line. I can't make that. But um, by, by moving it from a steeper line at the black one to a flatter line, 
it means my material, my end result material becomes less uh, sensitive to movements in the pavement. And that was really important. And that's what lit me up to say, uh, this could be a good interlayer product. And, and the good folks out at uh, UCPRC um, saw the same thing in their testing. Yeah, and there's, and there's the conclusions uh, to that. And uh, as you can see highlighted, they came back and said, hey, th th this is unbelievable. We're getting uh, a lot of protection out, out there at the high strain levels. So, uh, you know, perfect for overlays over jointed concrete pavements. And that combined with the success that Phil had at his first go round uh, at Taylor County, we went back to the lab and really took uh, what we learned at Taylor County, what we learned from UCPRC and put it to work to create what is now Army. Um, and so putting our mouth, or, or, or if you will, putting our, our performance testing where it needs to be, we described this product high performance test um, from a reflective cracking standpoint we're going to run ideal ct and it will be better than 650 uh, in index uh, anywhere in the country that this product is made and as you can see from the bending beam fatigue test uh, you know a minimum of 20,000. now we will share with you uh, that what we've developed in kentucky is actually quite a bit better than that about 30 percent better than that in both categories um, now, it has to maintain enough rutting protection. Uh, again, being an interlayer, it's going to be anywhere from, a, a, you know, an inch and a half to four and a half inches below the surface, you know, with surface mix on top. So you still have to protect it, okay? So you still have to have a number, uh, at least an amount of uh, rutting protection of 5,000. So um, what's included in the Army package? Uh, it's aramid reinforcing, and it's... Uh, anywhere from 4.2 to a, a single dose to a double dose, 8.4 ounces. And that depends on the design. As we move around the country and work with producers, uh, you're gonna see that we're using locally sourced materials from that producer, both raw materials and uh, binder opportunity. We're gonna run a mixed design validation of both Ideal CT and Hamburg, and it better meet our table, or we're gonna go back to the drawing board and redo the mixed design. Um, we're, we will then do a, a production mix validation. Once we get into uh, production, make sure that it's still the day that we're making asphalt or making the, the army, that it actually is meeting our expectations. Um, and of course, uh, like our Ace XP polymer fiber, we will uh, bring the blending and equipment to deliver the army uh, airmid to the plant site, take care of any training certification um, and work with that producer to make sure that he has a successful job. So the key to this product is as we were in the lab, Phil kept coming back to, and, and sorry if I'm gonna beat up on this, Phil, but it's, it's an excellent saying, goes, we make good asphalt, excellent. We make bad asphalt, yeah, okay. So we can't make bad asphalt excellent, but we can make good asphalt really, really good. And how do you do that? Well, we, we've talked about this through this presentation. One of them is asphalt content. Look at the asphalt content in Army. It's seven to 10%. Uh, the testing was done at right about eight. Uh, look at where we're holding uh, uh, the air voids. Um, no more than two and a half. Holy cow, look at the gradation. That's a fine gradation of four, seven, five millimeter mix. And so at the end of the day, everything that we know that provides a wonderful crack resistant mix design along with the aramid, along with asphalt content comes together with our Army product. That's the success of the product. And that's what Phil brought to the table and so, Phil, thank you very much for the development work that you did on this wonderful product. Oh, thank you, Joe. Um, and we're uh, really excited about the the, uh, the several opportunities we have around the country right now to put this down uh, as soon as we get back to work. And uh, and I, I believe it's upon us. As I mentioned early, uh, hey, Joe. earlier. Hey, Yeah, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, and again, I want to apologize to our audience. Um, and thanks for everybody and putting the questions in the chats and stuff to uh, to help us understand what's going on with the, the WebEx earlier and trying to get rid of the, the admin screen. 
Uh, we know there's still a, um, a little small narrow strip over in the top right corner that's showing a little bit of like the, the X's and, the, and, and boxes. Um, I'm not sure Joe can get rid of that. So appreciate the feedback on that, but that, it's, a, it's, it's really a WebEx issue. And, and as one person put on there, uh, Joe's trying to make some adjustments you see now. As, as one person said, a Zoom is so much better. So we, uh, and I say WebEx issue, I keep saying WebEx, I don't know why I'm doing that. It's, it, this is a, uh, it's a, it's a go-to-meeting uh, format. So again, thank you for your, uh, thank you for your um, help with all that. Let's, uh, let's try that one more time, Joe, and let's just um, go on. We are, we're seeing captions, subtitles, we're seeing everything you're seeing right now, Joe. Okay, I'm gonna open this back up. Let's see what happens. Now. And it has gone black, Joe. It's trying to fix itself. And in uh, in trying to fix it, I think we have made it worse, Joe. Hang on. Oh, whatever you have done, there's a little black line through the top, but it's livable. Let's roll with it. That looks so Bill, good. So, here's the yeah the slow mo of uh, the roller going across your job at Taylor County, and uh, now I have. Are you guys seeing the, the words across the bottom? That's interesting. I don't know how I did that. But anyway, uh, very, very <laughs> durable mix um, and really pretty impressed uh, with uh, the way it performed. And our Army product will actually have twice the amount of uh, air emit in it that this product did. Uh, so we're really excited about the product. If you feel like you've got an opportunity for it, please uh, let us know. We're going to move forward now, Phil, and pull this whole thing, this whole um, good, better, best, and test together. As I mentioned, the goal was to know uh, your existing mix design and then how that existing mix design would uh, perform with a single and a double dose. And then we want to marry that uh, to the, the problem. And you know, you're going to get a certain amount of crack resistance out of a single dose, a certain amount out of a double dose, and a huge amount out of uh, Army uh, with a single dose of air in the surface mix. And so this is really where we need to go. But before we get there, the best solution isn't always the best engineering solution. The economics have got to come involved. And I know people are chomping at the bit, kind of under, wanting to understand cost. So... We put this slide together and I married it with the good, better, best uh, ideal CT numbers above. So a single dose, uh, a double dose, and then the Army product itself. And the costs are in the, in the orange at the bottom, looking at a two and a half inch overlay, okay? Um, and uh, that is the thinnest section we can put down with Army. So the, the bottom inch would be an inch where the, the bottom of that two and a half inches would be an inch thick for Army. The top would be an inch and a half of standard mix, okay? So the, the cost add-on, if you will, per square yard, and then comparing it to other products that have been used in this interlayer industry, um, you know, paving fabrics on the left, uh, SAMI, uh, uh, you know, uh, stress-absorbing uh, membrane interlayer, which is basically, uh, you know, liquid asphalt stone and, and some fiberglass. Uh, Phil, your old, uh, your first product, Strata, and then a typical paving grids off to the right. As you can see, ACE, single dose, double dose, and Army plays very, very well in that cost. Point. So from $1.80 a square yard up to about $4 a square yard uh, for these solutions. So, you know, the, the best engineered solution is the product that does the job meets the performance demands at the lowest cost. So as an engineer, you always have your choice. And as those running their budgets, they only have so much money to spend. We recognize that. But we want you guys to have options. 
And as I mentioned earlier, you don't approach every engineering problem the same way. And so uh, know your crack. So let's review this. Uh, in step one, know your cracking and rutting numbers of the existing mix design. Step two, know what those are with 4.2 and 8.4 ounces of polymer, Ace XT polymer fiber. Step three, evaluate the project you're putting it on and let's marry that performance uh, to the solution that you're trying to achieve and then marry it to your budget. And so really on any given job moving forward out of from surface tech, you have at least three options to help mitigate your cracking problems moving forward. We put this together to help with all this. And so as you look across the top, uh, down the, the, the left-hand side, this uh, easels, uh, you know, per million, if you look across the top, notice that we've put in this idea of crack solution and marrying your crack solution to your problem. So if you have moderate cracking, maybe you only need an ideal CT performance of 90 to 115. And how are you going to achieve that? Well, look, as you go down through here, you can look at a 6422 mix with 4.2 ounces of Ace XP polymer fiber. And notice when we get down to an interstate, we're suggesting to go to the double dose with the 6422 uh, to help improve uh, the rutting side of that 6422 and get it up to where a 7622 would be. You know, if you have something really severe or moderate to uh, severe cracking, maybe the block cracking that Bill was talking about, um, you may want to suggest a, a double dose of uh, Ace XP polymer fiber with the appropriate binder uh, type in your area. And then notice all the way to the right, when we get to asphalt over concrete, we're not necessarily suggesting uh, either a single or a double dose. Maybe economics say you can do that or that's all you can do but what we are saying is to get the best performance you're going to need that army inner layer with then the minimum uh overlay thickness that uh that the army requires and of course uh, i think we lost that screen when the, everything got goofy on us there uh the minimum thickness of army is uh from about 1 million easels is an inch and a half for surface mix all the way up to 30 million easels, which would be three and a half inches of surface mix over the top. And so that's how this is all uh, put together. Uh, this is in our, our Good, Better, Best and Test brochure uh, that uh, we have available on our website. So if you want some easy guidance, we tried to put this together. Okay. Another example of pulling all together is what's going on at MoDOT out in Missouri. And this is uh, uh, a specification that they are rolling out this year as they get back to work in that state. And notice that uh, they have ideal CT uh, out here and the contractors are having to run the test. Also notice how low their numbers are. It's, it's pretty interesting. But what we like the most is MoDOT has decided to pay more for the better crack resistance they can get. That's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, it's not really full balanced mix design, but what it is is shifting the idea that there are better mix designs to be paid for. And if we get a better mix design that attenuates cracking, we're going to have less maintenance dollars spent on that over time. I love this a lot. This is the right way for the industry to be moving. And uh, we're really excited to uh, have been part of this and uh, from the standpoint of providing. Uh, some opportunities for uh, 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 Mr. Butler's group out there to see how our product might fit into all this. Okay. Okay, Phil. So we're going to go on to the R&D spotlight. And uh, to get everybody kind of psyched up for that, let's ask this question. Okay, Joe. Um, here we go. Uh, Joe would like uh, to ask this question. That would be, I'd like to see more recycled asphalt pavement used if, and if you want to uh, uh, put those in, if you can see improved crack resistance, lower cost, improved crack resistance, same cost, improved crack resistance. Um, looks like that's a repeat, Joe. 
Oh, same crack. I'm sorry. Same crack ah. resistance, lower cost, same crack resistance, same cost, or ah. never. Never. Yeah, I, I threw you for a loop there. So you did. Just kind of curious did. how everybody feels about it. I mean, yeah. and uh, we're, we're going to address this here in the next three slides. And I'm just kind of curious how uh, everybody might feel. Um, there's something to it. I mean, there is something to lowering the cost of our asphalt, paving more roads, but we don't want to give up our performance, I don't think, to do that. So that's why this Joe, becomes such a polarizing uh, issue, right? Joe, I am typing as fast as I uh, can, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to answer just a few questions here very quickly. Um, this one came in, and these are just quick to answer. Is Sassabit wax, um, does it act as a warm mix agent? No, there's not enough of it in there for that. It's only about two ounces of the wax and just holds the, the aramid together. You need 20 to 30 ounces of the wax to really be a warm mix agent. Uh, strain level that's used for um, the army interlayer is 2000 micro strain. Now, while there is a, um, a higher level of product out there called Strata, and it's up there at like 100,000 cycles, uh, this product, the army is, is lower than that. Again, it's, it's a, it's a, um, we're, we're aiming for a, a lower version of that. Uh, could we actually put the aramid in to actually make it perform like that other inner layer with the blend of polymer? Absolutely. Uh, but again, um, at this point, what was coming out originally was just something to, to help mitigate cracking and, and also at a good price point. Um, the recommended aramid fiber con uh, contains wax. Um, in, uh, is this a, in general, wax is a problem at low temperatures? Um, it, it could be. Uh, however, what we do is, is simply, uh, if we have a really cool day or a wet aggregate, yeah, you have to slow the plant down just a little bit to make sure you get the, the proper temperature. But it's also important to get the proper temperature in order to get your, uh, to get your asphalt to coat your aggregate. So uh, we're not seeing any issues with that. And, uh, and again, that's why we have uh, on-site support to take care of all that. So again, thank you for all your questions. I'm going to close the poll now, Joe, and I'm going to share that with everyone so they can see it. Um, um, we have uh, quite an array of answers there, Joe. I'll let you, I'll let you digest that one. And I'll close that here in about uh, 20 seconds. Yeah. For whatever reason, I haven't see, been able to see these all day. This is crazy. Okay. So, oh, um, I mean, yeah. I can see it now cause I opened it right. up and you can probably see my screen, but, uh, no, actually everything looks good. So don't touch anything right now. I'm not touching a thing, dude. Okay. It looks good. Yeah. But yeah, the improved crack resistance at, at a lower cost, boy, that would be great. Um, and then our next uh, two sort of in the same grouping together was improved or same crack resistance, the same or lower cost, uh, same crack resistance, same cost at 5%. And then, uh, I uh, would like to see more recycled asphalt pavement. 5% said never. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah, Joe. There's, there's a reason for that, as we all know, and we're going to talk about that here. Uh, let's move forward. So this is uh, this is something that uh, Phil and I and uh, are working on, and uh, we, we feel a little passionate about that, about this subject, and that is, and when we thought about it from the very beginning. You know, can we use more wrap? Um, when we're using air. Uh, can we offset a certain amount of wrap when we are using air mid uh, to uh, a get rid of all these mountains of wrap that we have building in, in certainly the major uh, metropolitan areas of our country. So what if we could use more wrap in our mixed designs and provide equal or better performance compared to its lower percentage cousin? You know, and I think everybody in that poll question is, is especially those 5% that said never. And the, the reason they said that is because it was a great idea and it's been done before. And you promised us all of these things up above, right? Reduce cost of the asphalt pavement, reduce uh, uh, amount of virgin binder use, uh, maybe even reducing the amount of modification, uh, reduce the needed aggregate used. Pave more roads with the same budget, reduce the mountains of wrap. Uh, you know, hey, it's going to require less CO2 emission, a greener solution. But guess what happened when a lot of states went from under 15% wrap up to 50% wrap, up to 5-0% wrap? They immediately had crack performance problems. And the reason for that is, guess what? We made the mixes too stiff. 
Um, you know, in, in the era of where we're at and how this fits in this entire discussion is let's change this around. Let's rethink this. Was the method by which we adopted the RAP maybe questionable? Okay. Was it missing some newer ideas that we're using and, and giving out today? And that is absolutely there were some missing links back four or five, ten years ago when we tried this. Okay. Uh, one, we weren't really taking this balanced mix design approach at that point. Okay, we weren't looking at volumetrics and coupling it with in lab performance testing. We are so far down the road now of understanding how our asphalts perform in the lab. We can do a great deal better today, okay, uh, in uh, the experimental side of that. So, those were two big missing components back then. And I would say the, the third check mark there is the use of these additives, uh, both. Uh, the Aramid, our product, Ace XP polymer fiber, and as uh, well as some of these liquid binder modifiers that are out there that actually allows you to lower the PG grade of the liquid binder being used to compensate uh, for the higher percentage of wrap. As, as a result, you end up able to take a 20% wrap mix and make it a 40% wrap mix kind of performing the same or equal. Hey, Joe. Even better, um, yeah. I had forgotten to hide that poll and where you couldn't see it on your end, uh, again, it's, it's, <laughs> the controls have changed. Um, it, some of those slides weren't being displayed. So um, continue on with where you're at, but I think we have that fixed now. And folks, we're, we're running, uh, because of some of these issues too, we're running a wee bit behind on this. But, yeah, hang, hang with us and we'll uh, continue on with this. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Phil. Appreciate that. So, you know, the bottom line is let's use what we learned from before and have caution about adding wrap, but let's do it the right way today uh, with the balanced mix design, the performance testing, and some of these wonderful uh, plan introduced uh, additives that are available today. And let's get after it and let's relook at it. Well, Here's, I'm just going to share with you one mix that we've done so far. Um, and the control, is, so uh, the, the ideal CT is in blue, the Hamburg's in green, uh, the RRI is in orange, and uh, the, the stripping point is in yellow. Okay, but let's look at control uh, itself. It's 5.6% liquid AC a 64, 22, 20% wrap. Came back without any ACE in it, came back at 55.9. So what we did is say, okay, let's take it to, we were shooting for 40 volumetrically, it, it, it kind of shook out at 38%. We added some Aramid and we've added this liquid binder modifier. And uh, so we went in the first iteration next to the control in blue, the high wrap 5.8%, that's actually 5.8% of liquid AC. So we bumped it two tenths in liquid AC, added the air mid, and added the modifier. And you can see, holy cow, we uh, really provided uh, a quite an improvement in, in cracking. Um, and it's pretty affordable, maybe a little bit more in cost, but not a lot. So we went back to the drawing board and took a tenth out at 5.5 from 5.6. And you can see 38% is still performing better than the control at 20 and the running guys just kept getting better. So this is doable. And uh, Surface Tech is working very hard behind the scenes right now to come up with a, uh, a product launch that's going to help everybody in the industry if you want to not only use more wrap, but also have the choice of just how much performance you want out of that higher wrap mix. It's Joe, one possible. question. One yeah, question. Well, that, go ahead, I was going to say one question that came in was about the economics and about this very slide. And they asked this about oh, probably 45 minutes ago. So uh, thank you for putting that one up, Joe. And of course, the economics really depends upon your materials. And I'll just throw out this one that there's not only a value in the asphalt that's on the wrap, but a huge value in the wrap is an aggregate replacement. 
And so it really depends upon your area and what the value is. A, a round number I've used a lot is about $7 a ton of, is, is where the wraps value that. Uh, but again, it's different for different places. With that, if you if these are things that you wanted to work at and look at the economics um, from my lab to working with the guys at Surface Tech, we would be glad to look at that with you. Absolutely. And uh, on this particular mix, uh, where it was being generated, uh, the the middle the let's say the middle column was slightly more expensive uh, with both additives in it than control at 38 percent, but almost a break even. Uh, and the, the third column there, the 69 ideal CT, uh, was uh, on the other side of that. So a break even to slightly less expensive. We believe, and this is what we're in the lab uh, proving out right now, we believe we can push this mix all the way to a 50% with both a break even in performance and possibly an uptick in performance. We know now that uh, with varied amount of aramid in this modifier, we can push that performance to wherever the, let's say the owner wants it to be. So we feel relatively comfortable to say we can take any control mix and add uh, quite a bit of wrap to it and give you the results that you're looking for. Uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. And again, it fits into this whole good, better, best and test idea that we've been playing with uh, and talking about today. So anyway, from our R&D shelves to your uh, imagination, let's put it that way. Uh, if you have anything that you would like to bounce off of us, we are looking for folks to work with and 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 get this uh, get this launched. Uh, it's really really, as Phil will say, it's an exciting time to be in the asphalt business, right, Phil? Always, Joe. <laughs> it's uh, 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 with that, Joe. Um, Again, we continue to answer questions on this one and um, and uh, thank you all for continuing to post those and hopefully everything is, we've gotten it all worked out. Uh, Joe, go right ahead. And I know uh, we got one more poll question coming up here shortly, yeah, yeah. but yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, everybody go right ahead and, and continue to pick, get your questions. I'll continue to answer them on my side. Yeah, so uh, team uh, on, on the call here, we're gonna walk through some uh, examples, field validation, give you some background on some of these projects that have been down for a while. And, and again, I, I can't overstress that from Surface Tech's perspective, we recognize that it has to be uh, both validated in the lab, but also field validated. If we're not getting the performance in the field, the lab validation means nothing. Uh, and so what you're going to see as we go through these slides is uh, uh, a lot of validation for our claims. And for that, if you remember uh, that very first introduction slide that I said, all these wonderful things about our product, it's true. So uh, one of the first jobs that we did with Loves, in fact, the very first job we did with Loves back in 2015 uh, was in Sadieville, Kentucky, not too far from where, where Phil's sitting today, um, was down, put down in November of 15, um, and we've been watching it ever since. And uh, what I want to do is take you through a, a series of pictures. Here's uh, the project going down. And, you know, the, it's interesting uh, as you go from uh, truck stop to truck stop. And I don't believe Loves is too much different. In a lot of cases, they're being put in where, uh, you know, this kind of facility wasn't planned for in the past, right? So you're having to put in a new turn lane. And in a lot of cases, you have one single input and output, or if you will, one entrance and one outlet on a single uh, roadway going into these facilities. So this is a real key area to be watching because every truck and every car that goes into Loves is coming down this turn lane and turning uh, where you see the roller down here in the bottom right. Uh, so this was installed November 15. I'm gonna show you fast forward to April 16. And that's this very road coming in you can start seeing some blemishes out here underneath the truck uh, up there in the upper left-hand corner. That is where the county road has started to ravel and come apart with all the, the traffic that's hit it since uh, the Love's truck stop went in. So what is that, uh, you know, what, five or six months? Not, not very, very much time, but went through a winter. But you can see the stop sign. 
Hey, we got tire marks, but there are there's no cracking, there's no rutting. Um, fast forward to June 4th of 2019, when we went out and took these pictures, uh, right in front of this car is that, is that stop sign. Uh, here's the stop sign behind that truck. Again, no rutting, no cracking. It looks wonderful. And Joe, I, I was going to add, this truck yeah. stop is actually, of course, off of I-75. I-75 corridor is sort of a, a 30 to 40 million ESOL, 20-year ESOL route. And this is the primary truck stop uh, north of uh, where you where you come in and, and connect here to the I-64. So a lot of, lot of heavy traffic. Uh, on this one. Yeah, it's pretty, uh, if you get there at a certain, a couple certain times a day, uh, every one of these lots in the back will be filled with trucks, resting, sleeping, taking showers. It's unbelievable the business that they do. Um, so when we uh, went out in, in 19 here back in June, and we said, okay, this is doing so well. And it's one of our oldest projects. Let's go find another love store that was put in about the same time that did not use our technology, but did in fact use uh, a very similar mix design. And so uh, Knightstown, Indiana is about 100 miles north, maybe not quite that far, just outside between Indianapolis and uh, Dayton on I-70. It was put in at the same time. They used 6422, um, but they used no air in it. And here we are. Here's how their uh, their lots look. There's a uh, quite a bit of difference between that and this. Um, and a reason why uh, Loves has made uh, Ace XP polymer fiber a standard on every new store that goes in. They're trying to eliminate this. They're trying to extend the life of their pavements. So that's from a cracking perspective. Back to Sadieville. Um, this is from a rutting perspective. The most, uh, let's say, difficult place to resist the rutting has always been between the concrete apron and the asphalt butting up against it uh, and this general area because there's a lot of start and stopping at the fuel depot. You can see we have very minimal uh, rutting going on uh, at Sadieville. That's with Ace. Here's that Knightstown job without ACE. Uh, this is what's going on. And this is why the product uh, is, is a tool for balanced mix design. It's giving loves performance both in cracking and rutting. Now, we mentioned early about uh, strength and adding uh, strength to pavements. We also did some testing at uh, the Love site in Sadieville, and we came up with field modulus. And this was uh, done by our partners, NGOs. It's an automated plate load test where they go out and they can either put a static or a repetitive cyclic load on this uh, plate sensor up here in the right-hand corner, measure the response of the asphalt, and back it into a modulus. Um, we had this done in 16, and the results were staggering. We had it done in the Loves job in Kentucky, and there was another job we did with them in early 16 down in Louisiana. We had both jobs tested, compared against control, or in this case, uh, Sadieville didn't have control, so we used the asphalt standard uh, for Ashto here for 450,000. And you can see that we have about 150% increase in modules as measured by NGOs at these two sites. And again, using a uh, standard for uh, the one site at uh, Sadieville. You back into those calculations and say, what does that mean from a layer uh, coefficient standpoint? It's, a, it's about a 40% measured difference in the field. This is why we say you can use 30% uh, uh, improvement in your structural layer, uh, structural number layer coefficient if you have an engineering reason to do that. Uh, from where we sit at Surface Tech, if it's a good idea to reduce section, um, there's probably an engineering reason for that. It can't all be economics. And from the standpoint is uh, uh, if you're going to thin up a section, you better make sure that it's performing good from a cracking and rutting standpoint to start with and that it's properly designed. Uh, but there is a lot of engineering reasons sometimes that it would be just great if we could get a little bit of asphalt out of our mix. 
Well, here's how that table kind of plays out. If uh, you look at the structured number uh, table um, using a 30% improvement in your layer coefficient. I mean, you can make a, uh, you know, a four inch uh, unreinforced be three and a quarter inches uh, with ACE if you want to do that. It, it can be done. And that's with a single dose, mind you. That's not with a double dose. So there's benefits there even over and beyond uh, cracking and rutting that loves the seeing. And it's playing into this whole uh, polymer modification replacement program or certainly giving them options as they run into difficulties getting that polymer grade in certain uh, rural applications that they have across the country. So moving on, another one of our older jobs uh, was an asphalt overlay project and not too far from where I'm sitting, went down in July of 15, and we've been tracking it for a while. Um, typical job here in Ohio, um, you know, if we've got the, uh, the thermal cracking, if you will, from side to side, the job itself doesn't look terrible, not a lot of rutting, um, but uh, this is where uh, the county wanted to try this. So an inch and a half overlay went down and within the first year, there was the crack that started coming back. Uh, the control lanes on the left, the ACE XP lanes on the right, um, all 13 of the longitudinal joints came back through the control section in that first year and none on the ACE XP side. So this picture is very typical of every one of those uh, joints. So we have followed this joint uh, you know, through uh, su subsequent years. Here's year two of that joint. And you can see uh, it's starting to grow into the ACE lane. Bill, explain to everybody uh, sympathy cracking and how that uh, plays into this. Yeah, no problem, Joe. <clears throat> um, <laughs> sympathy cracking, I love the term. Um, yeah, it's kind of like, yeah, you know, it's what. Yeah, so. Yeah. So we, I used to see this one when, when I would go do interlayer controls and, and trials. And what happens, the, the crack will move from one side over to the other, and and it just, uh, no different than putting a an asphalt overlay down in a concrete curb and gutter area, wherever that crack is in the concrete curb and gutter, uh, have mercy, man, it will just always uh, make that asphalt crack. So the only way to stop this would is actually take a core um, at the end of that crack to, to stop it from going across. So. Um, that's what uh, th that's how those happen, and it, again, it just tends to move across. So I do not like side by side uh, control and and trials because of that. That's why most of the work that you'll see at a bigger scale is done end to end. However, the side by sides always make great pictures for the first few years. Absolutely, and so you know the stress at the head of this crack is certainly more than the stress on the edge over here, right, Phil, where it hasn't cracked yet on the A side. And so it, it's kind of an unfair kind of situation, but at the same time, we're still fighting that crack back and it's not propagating. Year three, okay, it's kind of made halfway over. It's made its, uh, its way over, but we're still holding it back. And the crack tends to be tighter uh, than, you know, the control side. So, Crack count after three years, and keep in mind, Ideal CT says anywhere from 30 to 50 percent improvement in crack mitigation. Well, in that first year, we were 100 percent. By year three, we're down to 27 percent. Um, the question becomes then, uh, where is the maintenance going to come in? At what point? And uh, holding that crack tighter, uh, we, we do believe the maintenance will even be pushed out further on our side because of the main fact that. Uh, uh, we're reducing uh, the crack width and doesn't need to be repaired uh, quite yet. So um, you can see how it plays with lab um, and uh, it validates the lab approach. Let's go on, Phil. Uh, you love this job over in Plainfield, Indiana, just outside of uh, Indianapolis. This is an interesting project as it's a two inch mill and overlay with 7622 and polymer or ASEXP polymer fiber. And the, the city really wanted to control their cracking problem. Went down in fall of 18, pictures taken in the spring of 19. Well, you can see the pictures here very clearly, and you can see some samples being taken out of the road. You're going to see some testing, and we did some S SBP, that's CB testing uh, on this project. But very clearly on this day, as it was a little damp and foggy, 
There's no cracking in the ace lane. And we've already got cracks coming back at every one of those joints that was underneath. Uh, another picture here, same thing. Here's, uh, here's some of the samples that were taken out to run the SCB. No cracks, no cracks, and cracks already. Now, keep in mind, go back to that Texas uh, ideal CT numbers that I, that I showed earlier. 7622 is not very good in cracking by itself. Look what it's doing by adding ACE to that, six, uh, to that 7622. And I'd venture to say the city really should have used 6422, uh, maybe with a double dose of ACE for both rutting and cracking, and they'd have an even better product uh, today. But that's where we're at. Uh, the crack count, so we actually went out and, 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 and counted those cracks. And as you can see, uh, the ACE lane is just so much better. Uh, than the, uh, the control or the turn lane, uh, you know, but that's after six months, okay? But here's uh, something really important, Phil. This is uh, uh, one for you, the SCB IFIT uh, crack resistance uh, field testing done by the, the Heritage Group. Uh, they ran this and uh, the control was up there at the top in the first box. Uh, and then we have, uh, you know, two field samples uh, taken in the, in the bottom two boxes, I would point everybody's attention to the third box down uh, and compare it to the first box. The reason for that is uh, uh, the air voids that, that were measured uh, in the sample and in the middle box was a little high. So let's throw that out and just say, hey, we took an 8.6 index to a 12.4 or a 44% increase. So right there, a single, single dose went up 44%. Go ahead, Phil. Joe, while we don't like to look at that middle box, um, it is real. I mean, and we do hit air voids like that in the field. Uh, but the other thing, while we get all excited over the flexibility index, keep in mind these are indirect tests. And so you do see improved air, you see improved results with high air voids. That's not the reality. So the one fallacy on these tests is that high air voids give you better results. That's the exact opposite of what happens in the field. So that's why we're just saying just uh, don't pay attention to that one. So you look at this number here and you look at the, the bottom number there and compare that, there's your 44%. So again, another SCB test um, in, in all the testing that we've run in that 30, 50% improvement range. Okay, next uh, project down in Kentucky. This was actually the very first uh, project that I was involved in and back in 2015. Um, and this was a project, project put out by the KYTC on US 31, just south of Louisville. And basically it's a four and a half inch overlay over concrete. And uh, we got a portion to put down. Uh, they were looking at a number of uh, mix alternatives and uh, even some fabric overlays and grid overlays in this entire alignment. Uh, but we were given a little slither here at the bottom end uh, to put some ACE XP down. Uh, uh, and really it's a side-by-side -side comparison, but it's a five lane wide US 31. So two lanes going north and south with a turn lane in the middle. Uh, so back in 18 and 19, we started going out and doing crack counts and, you know, four and a half inches of asphalt fill, it, 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 the crack counts, the cracking really shouldn't have come back until, you know, what, four years. That's and right. We started seeing it in 19. So it was kind of right on cue. Uh, and this is the control side and the A side. Uh, it's it, There is no cracking quite yet back then. Uh, and this was uh, the crack count uh, of the, the north uh, northbound lanes for what they had the, the, the A center and the southbound lanes. Uh, and you can see the cracking starting to really uh, ramp up on uh, on the control lane. And, Joe. Uh, have, yeah, go ahead, Joe. It's it's so important that that you show these slides because we can prove stuff in a lab all day long, but how does it actually perform in the field? So I appreciate you putting these on there. And and for our listening audience, um, Joe just has a few more to go. So thank you all for staying with us and uh, gotten some really good feedback here. And and think that some people have commented, great data, uh, excellent presentation. And then uh, yeah, it's uh, Joe's got a very thorough slide set. So thank you all for uh, for staying with us. Go ahead, Joe. So if that wasn't enough, that we are seeing this improvement uh, in cracking uh, uh, happening in the field, we actually, uh, Surface Tech hired SNME, a good partner of ours, to, to go out and 
and do FWD uh, testing for us, falling weight deflectometer on both the control and the ASLAM. And so you're seeing a data set out of that. Um, and uh, you can cut and paste and, uh, and uh, any data set that you see. What we uh, chose to do was to look at the data and say, hey, here's the more consistent part of the control lane. And that kind of matches up better with the ACE lane. So we use the data that's in the middle of this and using the max modulus of 4 million, uh, which is the same as uh, PCC. The, the bottom line is you saw at the Love's truck stop, we saw 150% improvement in modulus. This is actually showing 425% improvement in modulus. Uh, again, using the data as we, as we uh, truncated it there. So um, again, there is something to what we're seeing with uh, the, the ruggedness that, uh, that the fiber is adding uh, to uh, the pavement, uh, the modulus improvement, uh, so forth, so on, in addition to the rutting and cracking. Okay, on to the, oh, here's one more picture. Uh, I forgot I took this one. This was uh, taken just this year, March of right before uh, COVID-19 hit. Here's the control lane. You remember the crack you saw earlier really wasn't too well defined. Well, here's uh, several cracks right in the row in, the, in, in that uh, control lane section. And you can definitely see it is coming way back across. The A side uh, still does not have any uh, cracks in it. So uh, we're gonna continue to follow this and continue to learn more about uh, how this is performing as we move on down the road. Um, the, the last job I have to share with you is a, a job that we put down with the South Carolina DOT. Uh, it's US-1 in uh, Patrick, South Carolina, which has one traffic light, very small town. Uh, but uh, US-1 is an old uh, concrete roadway that was put down, uh, I believe, 30 or 40 years ago. So it, it was at one time a pretty important route. Um, and uh, South Carolina has a lot of these roads that they're putting asphalt down over concrete. And so they, 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 they wanted to try a couple of things. And this was at the point, uh, you know, went down in fall of 2018 and Bill and I were already on to this idea of, hey, if we put more fiber in, it's gonna work better. And so we were able to work with South Carolina DOT to get both a single and a double dose of ACE into their project. Um, 6422 binder, 5.2% uh, liquid AC. On the map, you can kind of see at the stop line or uh, traffic light here, uh, back uh, approximately, uh, it's about three quarters of a mile uh, or so. Uh, that's the double dose section, and then the single dose section, and then the control section. So I went out and took pictures uh, when I was down there again uh, late in March. Uh, in fact, uh, my wife and I came back. She went on that trip with me. We came back uh, from South Carolina the, the Monday after they closed Ohio. <laughs> we were kind of worried if we were going to get back in. So anyway, so here's what these photos reveal. So the beginning of the project there on the map is here. You can kind of see where the overlay starts. And here's a nice picture looking all the way back down. There is no cracking, guys, in that double dose section zero, um, either transverse longitudinally, you know, uh, you know, edge cracking, just, just looks beautiful. So you go down to the next section, you start looking at the single dose, um, and you can see there was no milling here. They just put another uh, a couple inches, or actually four inches down over, and here's the old crack, and as Phil was saying, here it goes, right? And we kind of got some cracking back on the single dose side, but it's not terribly prevalent. It doesn't need to be fixed. It's not a nuisance. It's not a, a maintenance issue. And again, this is uh, you know two full winters in. Um, and so let's look at the control. Oh dear. So the control is definitely full with cracking and look how much wider and defined those cracks are. And just for comparison team, let, let me put the slide up. You know, here's what the double dose looks like. Here's what the single dose looks like. And here's what nothing looks like. Okay, so here's good and here's better. 
and it's playing out in the field. It played out in the lab. We verified it in the field. And so, Phil, um, uh, let's uh, move on to life cycle costs, and then we'll wrap up with the final poll question. We are about done. So, if we look at ASEXP polymer fiber and we look at a, uh, a one mile of roadway, and uh, we look at a, a period of 20 years, uh, we're gonna do a life cycle cost uh, uh, estimate on what that looks like. Uh, control mix, 6422, you uh, actually, uh, for everybody on the call, this, is, this calculator is out on our website. Please feel free to go out and play with it. It's interactive. You can put in all of the, this information that's in the blue boxes and it'll calculate it for you. Um, so the 6422 is here, uh, 6422 with ACE, uh, 6422 with a double dose of ACE uh, compared to a 7028, okay? Uh, and if you remember, I told you on that about the fifth slide or sixth slide that we take a 6422 and make it perform like a 7028 with a single dose of ACE. So these are kind of the right numbers in our area, you know, $80 a ton for a control mix, um, using $9 a, a ton, a plant ton for product and services from us to go in the mix, doubling that for a double dose. And uh, about th that's about what we're seeing. Any, you know, uh, average is about uh, 5 to 7 to $8 uh, a PG bump. So in this case, you've got two bumps, one on top and one on bottom. So $18 is pretty accurate in our part of the country. So having said all that, you go through the calculations. We come down here and you notice I put in life expectancy, nine years. Uh, we actually ran this for uh, Kentucky. Their average right now is their roadways or their overlays are lasting about nine years before they replace them. So using the idea of a 30 to 50% improvement, we took the single dose up to 30%. We took the double dose up 60%. And uh, the polymer uh, modification uh, folks say three to five years as well. So we uh, it just come down to the bottom. Here's, here's the bottom line. I mean, the best bang for the buck over 20 years on this analysis is the double dose 6422. Now let's turn to Army for a minute. Um, we did an Army example here as well, again, using 6422, a single, double, and then I used uh, 6422 surface mix, Army, and ASEXP uh, polymer fiber in that surface mix. And I have this estimated pretty high, guys. I, I don't think it'll quite be that high for all four and a half inches, but I left it in there. Um, so we went from $80 a ton to $150 a ton. But we're also taking, now keep in mind, this is an overlay, so four and a half inches thick. And what we saw out of Kentucky uh, on Kentucky 31 is, hey, we started getting cracks back in four years. Okay, so then I said, well, we're going to extend that to five years with ACE, a single dose. We're going to extend it to six years with a double dose. And then what's going on with Army? Well, we're, Army will keep that crack from coming back for a long time, and it'll be around for the second surface course to go down. So I put it at 14 years. At the end of the day, the best bang for the buck over 20 years is the Army solution. Now, again, back to bet, good, better, best, and test. What is the right solution for your problem? It's the best engineered solution at the lowest cost. But I can guarantee you there's plenty of DOTs around that know that stretch of concrete roadway that has asphalt over it needs to be replaced a whole lot. And so this option over here becomes a really, really good idea. The traveling public will love them to not have that road torn up every five years. Okay, so life cost analysis on top of performance, on top of good, better, best. Bill, take us home. Glad to do that, Joe. Uh, so for our last poll question, I'm going to go ahead and and launch that one now. And if you would um, uh, 
go ahead and, and help us out there and just let us know. With the information provided today, would you consider adopting a Surface Tech Aramid payment, uh, payment solution? So again, and we say, well, it's sort of a marketing question. It is, but it's also, it's a direct feedback to Steve, to Joe and the team at Surface Tech. And, and, it, and it helps to validate um, the information that we have put out today. So we do want to know from uh, the group that's out there, yes, you have a perfect project in mind. Yeah, you do have something small to get started. Maybe you would like to have some more information or everything I've got performs the same or other. We always like to have other because uh, it's always the good old default one. So um, leave that poll open here for another 30 seconds. Uh, one, one uh, again, uh, Thomas uh, just mentioned that that, uh, that he cannot vote. And again, folks, we're sorry with the go to meeting issues we've had. Uh, one comment that I thought was funny that came in, of course, some good ones here from India on their stone matrix asphalt and stuff like that, or, or, or uh, stone mastic asphalt, stone matrix. But another one um, that came in I thought was pretty funny. Uh, Joe, is there a reason for a Dollar General near every project picture? Uh, that is funny. <laughs> I've never noticed that before. I haven't noticed that either. That's that is funny. No, okay, there isn't. Go ahead and close this one. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to go ahead and close it here in just a moment, give it about another five seconds. Okay. And uh, thank you all again for participating in this last poll for us. And uh, we'll naturally have follow-up uh, for you all. And again, all the questions that you've put in the, the chat and the different areas, uh, those are all captured to where we'll be able to go through uh, through those and, and help answer anything more thoroughly. Um, Joe, I'm going to go ahead and hide this now, and uh, let's wrap it up. Uh, Steve uh, also has um, some closing comments for us too. We just read from here. Okay, so I guess uh, just in closing, uh, you know, what's in your asphalt? We need to know that. You need to know that. You know, improved performance is a choice. Know your numbers and s select the right solution. We're here to help you every step of the way. Uh, questions and then just the last plug for uh, asphalt uh, part three here on the webinar series and this is we're going to really uh, dive into the, the producer side uh, not only from how you implement uh, ideal CT uh, at the, the producer side for testing what that means uh, but then also the entire installation side uh, the training that uh, the product uh, uh, equipment that's been uh, created to deliver it and how that all works. So that'll be our third uh, webinar coming up on May 14th from 10, uh, what's it, 10 to 11 a.m. Pacific. That's not correct. It'll actually be 1 to 3 uh, Eastern Standard Time. So on the 14th. So look for that. Many of you have already signed up. I appreciate all your time today. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Mr. Steve Santa Cruz to take us home. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Phil. Thanks, everybody, for hanging in there. You, you saw the little bit of technical difficulties that we have, but I think the, the, the guys work through it very well. And it's a testimony to transparency, which is one of those terms that uh, the industry tends to bristle at a little bit. But you can see that we try to be as transparent as possible. There's really no secrets, and we want to share exactly what's going on with regard to our product. And uh, uh, as you can see through the presentation, particularly on Phil's side, you know, with the balanced mix design in mind and performance testing, and then marrying that to the technology that we have in terms of our value propositions, which I mentioned at the beginning of the uh, uh, presentation today in that you have a cost savings, you have performance uh, benefits, you have a sustainability story, and you have an ease of adoption at plant, ease of getting into critical path. All of those are really critical to take into consideration, especially the first in terms of cost um, um, care. Uh, and I think that uh, the organization has done a really good job with regard to the marriage of um, it's concept to lab testing to field performance to actually really benefit uh, the industry with regard to this product lineup. So from a bottom up to a top down type of solution, I think you see that it's a pretty significant uh, 
crack mitigation solution, and uh, that's what Surface Tech is trying to provide. As I share with my team, we're trying to provide aspirins, not vitamins. So thank you again mm -hmm. for hanging in there, and uh, look forward to uh, seeing all of you on the final series of asphalt uh, tech technology. Thank you. Signing off now. Everybody stay safe. We'll talk to you on the 14th. Bye -bye. Thank you all much. Take care.